74 of the Video Game Pals, the Pals Network's weekly video game podcast where a group of lifelong gamers get to talk about video games, the news, and how it all makes us feel. I'm your host, Pete and Jess. Wow, Pete and Jesse. That's what I almost just said there. <laughs> I, I, stu- I stumbled through that first sentence and I was like, I'm just going to keep rolling, man. Don't even think about it. You're a professional. And then here, I can't even say my own fucking name. I'm your host, Pete and Bessie, joined today by my ever present co host and antagonist, a guy whose name I remember, Mr. Andy Brown. Oh, I hope you know you're never going to live down Pete and Jesse. Yeah, no, no. I'm sure you'll be bringing it up uh, 125 episodes from now. Like, like anytime I see you like eating a burrito or some other large amount of food, it's like, oh, it's Pete and Jesse. I like it. <laughs> that could be worse. <laughs> yeah. It's like uh, mild bullying. That's what we're about here. That, that like almost makes me, it feels like it's like, that should be the regular name of like a, a weird superhero like Matter Eater Lad. Like he should have a pun name about how much he likes to eat, you know? I'd right. be there for that. If I ever make a cookbook, we just came up with the title. Boom. So Jesse's <laughs> cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> 1,000 recipes with Pete and Jesse. <laughs> oh, uh, so then also joining me today is the edgelord I'd never trust a babysit, Mr. Robert Thompson. Whoa, what are you saying? <laughs> What type of allegations are you making against me? What the hell, man? <laughs> what? When we talk about Life is Strange 2, you'll understand. Nothing oh, weird or gross. What the fuck? <laughs> I'll say, about to say don't put me around children that's messed up Thompson right. was very mean to a nine-year-old boy in my let's play series that's all I have Dude, to say you said you would punch a child in the face <laughs> yeah. I never said you should have me babysit either and I didn't say I would punch a child in the face I said I'd met 10 year olds that I would want to punch in the face totally different even if you have the, the the desire to punch a child in the face like how can you judge Thompson for something I mean, you'd do worse. <laughs> no, I, 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 I wouldn't do worse. I said that I have thought you about thought. doing worse. He yeah. probably has never thought about it. No, because I don't beat kids. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm worried about you. I'm worried about you as I, a parent. I'm worried about you around children Sean, in general. Sean, I promise. That's, that's a weird ethical question. Is it is it better to have worse desires and not act on them? Or to act on desires that are still bad, but less bad. I think I come out on top. Well, he only acted on them in a video game, not not in real life. Well, no, I just yelled at the kid. I just I want to just point <laughs> out, I was the one at this on the driver's seat on that game, and you go watch. I was a great dad. Thompson specifically said, "You're way too nice to this kid." That's a direct quote from Thompson. That I was too nice to a child whose father had been killed. He might have been right. There's no, there's no way to know. But to punch a child is unilaterally wrong. But I haven't done but, that. But you want to. Well, I, I, your I said I have one. All right, listen. Also joining us today is the cross-examiner himself, Mr. Sean Bartley. Hello, hello. I don't know what I'm involved in here. There's, <laughs> we talk about children way too much on this show We're in always negative ways. talking about kids getting beat up. We're talking about which Smash Brothers character fucks. We're talking about video games. Welcome back to another episode of the Video Game Pals. We're going to be kicking things off the way we sometimes do by talking about what we're playing this week. So, Sean, uh, why don't you give us an update on... Uh, how your guild beyond the flames has been doing in world of warcraft battle for azeroth sure uh so another week another boss killed this time it was vectus making us four out of eight which puts us at the halfway mark of golf claps everyone golf claps (laughs) (laughs) so we're at the halfway point of completing mythic old deer which is pretty good uh most guilds are a little a little less completed than ours about three out of eight mostly uh so we're right we're, we're right where we want to be we're in the pocket um i'm not feeling the pain yet uh and i don't think any of us really are it's, it's been fun it's been fun uh, it's been challenging but it's been enjoyable uh of course given the fact that new york comic-con is coming up i have to miss thursday's raid so that's not great but hopefully the guild can carry on without me Mm. <laughs> I hope they can. Mm, yeah. <laughs> do Do you have faith in your number two? Who's leading the charge while you're AFK? Uh, well, I won't say their names because I don't want to give them any shine. But uh, <laughs> do I do I feel confident in them without me? Um, yeah. You know, honestly, I do. I think things have been going really smoothly. Uh, I've actually kind of taken a bit of a step back in terms of um, 
leading in the raid because as a healer it's really hard to do that and i had to do it for many years so it's been nice to be able to just focus on what i'm doing and help guide rather than be the sole uh vocal leader during the actual encounter that's good yeah especially because when you do have situations like this like I imagine if you're the only one who knows how to lead the charge, it's going to make the guild fall apart if you're ever unavailable for any reason at all. Well, let's see. I went away, so I went to Florida on vacation uh, a year ago. Actually, it was two years ago. And during that period of time, there let's see, there was crying. Uh, <laughs> there was uh, vicious personal attacks. Oh, my God. There no, no new boss kills. Um, and, and there was drama. And none of that was happening when I was present. It was the week that I left and all that unfolded. So, you know, I'm hoping that it's nowhere near that. All right. Well, good luck to you guys beyond the flames. I know a couple of you tune in every once in a while. So, uh, Godspeed and, uh, don't, don't make a mess for Sean to come clean up. He's going to have a rough week. If you're looking for a replacement, Sean, I will send in my resume. Um, I'm great (laughs) at video games. Hey, and, you, you've got like a level two WoW character, right? You yeah, can get I've in got there. Like a level two werewolf rogue, I think. Okay, werewolf is not a uh, <laughs> class in WoW, um, and on top of that, your dedication is lacking, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and he just goes and drops like you know, pays for the eighty dollar maxed out character. He's like, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, to get a character that could perform in a raid and not be inadequate cost you a lot more than eighty dollars like you can buy characters from other players which is right. highly yeah. against the terms of service but it would cost you a lot At, in vanilla my my personal wow character was worth over a thousand dollars holy Jesus. shit yeah a friend of mine actually i remember bought a wow character um and uh i thought he was a giant giant dork for doing so is this like, a person i know yeah you know him we used to play in a band with him <laughs> oh of course it was of course Ooh. yeah so throwing some shade i know he listens to this show sometimes too so uh <laughs> i don't i don't know why you would pay money to have a character that's good at like just just put the time in don't be a casual jesus agreed there we go see sean knows he's an expert too what what, what where's your guild right now top top 300 guild Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know what you're fucking talking about. So I'm saying. I sure do. Do you, Do you know where you guys are in the leaderboard right now? I know last time yeah. we talked, you had like just come up. You were like uh, hovering around 150, right? So right now we're actually 147. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, we'll be back to talk about. Uh, well, Andy won't be back to talk about it next week while we're at New York Comic Con, but the following week, I'm very interested to hear how they did without you. So, uh, let's, so am I. We'll be back in two weeks to update you guys on that story. But uh, in terms of what else we've been playing this week, I am closing in fast on that Spider-Man Platinum. Uh, I haven't run credit credits on the game yet because I want to like get it with 100% and then put it to bed. But um, I'm at, uh, I think I'm at 96% completion. I have, like, two or three of the, um, like, there's, like, bases of villains, right? And, like, in the beginning of the game, it's, like, the kingpin bases. Like, by the end of the game, it's this other faction. There's, like, two different ones. So I think I have three more bases to knock out. And then I think there's one side quest left for me to do. And then I have to go back and do some of the challenges to, like, unlock the rest of the suits and shit. But uh, I'm, like, there's almost, you know, I got almost nothing left to do here. And I, I'm, I have the last story mission of the game like that's my primary objective right now, wow. so I'm ready. To, I'm ready to roll credits on it as soon as I, you know, decide I'm done. You know, and I want to just set myself up to get the platinum as much as possible because I know once you roll credits, you can go back and do more. But I also know myself, and I will have a real tendency to be like, I rolled credits, I can move on now. So I want to make sure I'm ready because I earned that platinum. I'm so fucking close to it at this point. I gotta just you know cross the T's and dot the I's as it were. Sure. Man, I'm a I'm a little little tweaked with the the time difference for platinums. You're over here. You're what? Probably 50, 60 hours in. I probably like forty or fifty. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, my hundred and ten hours in Persona Five, not even close. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to show for it. <laughs> the intent is to get a sense of achievement for unlocking the end of the game. Yeah. I forget how that comment from EA went. Right. 
But yeah, well, uh, Atlas doesn't understand that. In Atlas's mind, the purpose of playing the game is to pick a waifu, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's worse reasons to play the game. Yeah, it's fair. <clears throat> but um, I, I definitely would have gotten the Platinum for Spider-Man this week, but I had two things in particular uh, distract me, one of which is uh, the all the NES games that are on my Nintendo Switch now, thanks to uh, Nintendo Switch Online. Um, I was fucking around with those quite a bit this week and uh, playing some Super Mario Brothers 3 and, like, NES baseball. Uh, so <laughs> that was super fun. Um, uh, important question. Are you playing NES baseball with your dad? No, but that's actually a great idea. I gotta. I, I for a long time I've wanted to do a let's play series where I play games with my dad. And I that's think a that, great idea. That might be a good one. I really want to play because my dad's super into westerns, and I really want to play Red Dead Two with him and call it Rad Dad Redemption. It's an idea oh. Andy had like two years ago, and I'm just like, it's time now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got that whole new. We got a whole new YouTube channel. We got to fill up with content. So. That's right. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the, the game that really uh, caught my attention this week, and, and Thompson and I played it together over on Pals Play, so you can go check that out on our brand new YouTube channel that we just mentioned, uh, for, you know, the video game Pals YouTube channel. We don't have that URL yet, so go subscribe so we can get it. But yes. uh, it is Life is Strange 2, Episode 1, baby! We're here! <laughs> I'm so excited, you guys. I, I am Clearly. so fucking happy this game is finally here. It snuck up on me because September fucking flew by. Uh, we got we got the first episode in the bank. Thompson and I played uh, the whole thing on Pals Play this week. We have three half-hour episodes and then one hour and a half finale because this episode was so much longer than we thought it was going to be. Um, God, that, I, one, that one was a little emotionally taxing. <laughs> Dude, like, they cover so much emotional ground in this first episode. Like, I remember within the first, like, I want to say 20 minutes, Thompson called something super dark that was going to happen. And then, like, when it came to fruition, he was like, Jesus Christ, in this one episode, this has already escalated things as far as it took the first Life is Strange, like, three episodes. It's like, we're already at a point where this has, like, been tense and insane almost the whole time. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> uh, so I, there's so many things about this game that are are awesome. Um, but I think the the thing that I kind of took away from it is it's almost impossible to talk about the biggest, coolest moments without spoiling things that, unless you went and picked through every single like you know bit of what they'd given us beforehand, you definitely wouldn't have known. Um, but that's, I think, speaks to something that's great, is that there's a lot of surprises for you, even if you have been following with, along with the game like we have. Um, there was a couple things that happened for me and Thompson where we were definitely shocked by what happened or what some of the reveals ended up being, like, both big and small. Um, so uh, this is just, like, if you're a Life is Strange fan, like, don't, don't wait. Just go pick this up right now. Because this first episode is great, it's meaty. Like we said, there was three and a half hours worth of content, and we were trying to play a Let's Play. So it was like we didn't stop and pick through every single little thing. So I think if you take your time with it, you're looking at four hours worth of content there. Um, which, you know, we talked a couple months ago how the price tag had been bumped up from $20 to $40. And uh, Thompson and I both commented on how you can see where that money went, you know? that uh, th there's more content, the branches seem a lot wider. You know, uh, I think in The First Life is Strange, a lot of the choices uh, feel very binary. It's kind of like, did you do this or did you do this? Whereas in this game, there's a few different um, factors that make it really interesting that kind of affect how many choices you have to make. Like there's a um, <clears throat> uh, an advanced inventory system that we got to look at in the first episode that gave us a really good idea of how what you have on you matters at any given time. So, like, the primary thing is, like, there's money. And there's no money in the first game. There's no element of survival in the first game. So, but the two brothers we talked about, we know this from the previews, they're on the run. <clears throat> and they're trying to get to Mexico where they have family. So it's like you have, like, at the starting of the game, I did a few things that made it so I had $40 in my pocket. If I had played my cards a little bit differently, I could have had, like, 
50 bucks in my pocket or 60 bucks in my pocket. And when we got to a convenience store and it was time to buy money to feed our little brother, it was like, how much money do we have? How long is this going to last us? It's getting colder. Should we think about buying sleeping bags or do we want to get food? Can we get water for free somewhere else? Like, could we steal stuff? Like there was all these different options of how do you want to play out the situation and what, what are you going to do and how is it going to result in you having the most resources to keep yourself alive? That's incredible, actually. That's really, really, really cool. It's, it's really, really cool. Yeah. It's so different. Um, and then just from a story perspective, uh, they took it in a direction I really didn't expect, and it's it's been really cool. Like, there's a lot of social commentary in it so far um, that's not, like, heavy-handed. But it just feels very, like, I think authentic. You know, like, the, the two main characters are... Um, are like young Hispanic men. Like the the guy you play is like a sixteen year old, and his his younger brother is is nine. Um, that's and the one I yelled at. Yeah, that's the one that Thompson was very mean to. <laughs> hey, sometimes you have to be mean. Yeah, he had too many taco crisps. I mean, the little kid was being a brat. Dude, he is nine, and he. All right, we're not getting into this right now. Thompson and I argued about it plenty in our Pals Play series. Go watch it. Uh, either way. This is a fantastic first episode, and there's not much more I can say about it that isn't from a mechanical standpoint or a storyline standpoint without spoiling some of the big moments for you, which I certainly don't want to do. So, oh, no, go ahead, Andy. You mentioned an inventory system. Yes. In the tradition of classic point-and-click games, it's just you like have that. to attempt to combine every item to get the solution to a puzzle that makes no sense until you've done it. So it's not like the no sense stuff, <laughs> but the in terms of like mixing and matching stuff, it's very much like that. Like we had a oh, moment shit. where, um, like, okay, without again okay, without spoiling anything, we had a moment where our character was trapped, right? Okay, and you your brother isn't trapped, and it's this thing of like direct your brother based on what you can see and what you have in your inventory to do something, to get away, to escape, you know, the situation that you're stuck in. And, like, I had noticed things where it was like, oh, I'm pretty sure we could have taken a knife earlier in the game and we would have had it right now, but we don't. So we have to figure out what we're going to do based on what's available. And it was like a thing where I had poked around the area where we got trapped, so I knew where an item was, and I was like, oh, little brother, go get this item, and then we can use this. Solid. I like that. Yeah, it's it's really cool, man. Uh, they they really have done a good job of making it tonally and aesthetically feel like Life is Strange, but in the way that they've done with the prequel and then the Captain Spirit uh, little, I guess that was also a prequel to Life is Strange too. Um, but it's also kind of in the middle of the story. It seems like either way, uh, those each one of them has built on the formula. And made it so that, you know, the core hook of the first game is time travel. None of the other games in the series have time travel. You know? Nice. Wait, wait, whoa. whoa, whoa. I thought these games were just about, like, regular old slice of life stuff. Now you're telling me there's time travel? Well, there's there's superpowers, too, though, yeah. They are about slice of life, but all of a sudden, like, in anime, it's like, oh, but wait, you also have time powers. Yeah, like, uh, the main character... (laughs) The main character in the first game, Max, she has the ability to rewind time. Like, she can't, like, travel through time, like, in big, huge chunks. Um, But it's, like, if you do something and you don't like the outcome, you can rewind time and be, like, what happens if I do it this way? Or you can, like, do different stuff where it's, like, oh, I'll move this item so that it's here when I need it in the past or in the future or whatever. Like, that that kind of stuff. Um, Whereas in this game, like... uh, one of the brothers has superpowers, but he doesn't have time powers. Like, it seems like he has, like, like force powers almost. Like, like I remember in the preview that we... Jean Grey. <laughs> yeah, kind of like Jean Grey. Yeah. Like, it looks like he can, like, levitate stuff. Because I remember in the, oh. the preview uh, trailer that Thompson and I walked everybody through, there was the scene with the cop car that gets, like, flung into the street. Uh, and you oh. see some more of that at play in this first episode. So, um, yeah, I think... Again, if you're a fan of Life is Strange, you got to play this game. But I think even if you're not, even if you've just heard me talk about it and you've been interested in it, you can pick up this game with no context of the first one, and you'll it, it's a totally unique experience and one that I would highly recommend if you're into uh, narrative-driven games, adventure games like the whole choose your own adventure. Your choices really matter, and there's weight to your you know what you do, and it's it's one of those talky feely kind of games. If if all of those things are up your alley, if you're sad about Telltale Games getting shut down last week, uh, this is a game for you, and uh, I couldn't recommend it more highly. It, it's absolutely uh, living up to my expectations, and 
Um, I, I can't wait for the second episode. I, I was really impressed by this first one. Awesome. Maybe See, I'll finally check out the first one, and then, you know, six years from now, I can play Life is Strange too. <laughs> do it, man. I mean, that's the thing. Now's the perfect time, because you can go, and they have, like, the bundle, and it's, like, dirt cheap now, you know? So, like, you can get Life is Strange 1 and the prequel uh, and the free episode and have a ton of content to play through probably for, like, $30, you yeah. know? So go go check it out, guys. Um, definitely one that uh, I couldn't recommend more highly. So, if you guys want to let us know what you're playing this week, uh, you can write in the show and hear your thoughts right on the air. Give us a random question of the week, or just say hey by dropping us a line at thevideogamepals at gmail.com. Or you can get us on social media by following our sister show at The Comics Pals, wherever your social media is sold, and keep up with all the cool stuff we've got going on here at The Pals Network. If you're an audio listener, we'd really appreciate it if you guys could give us a like on your platform of choice. Or if you really want to help us out, you can head over to Apple Podcasts, where we're currently a five-star rated show. Try to break into that sweet six-star barrier. 74 episodes later, we still haven't gotten there. But uh, maybe this is the one. So uh, <laughs> if you guys uh, if you guys want to help out the show, as Sean likes to say, it uh, helps us a lot more than it costs you. So go over there. Give us one of those sweet reviews. Uh, and if you're over on our brand new YouTube channel watching us back in video, hello! Yes. Uh, you can do us a like. Uh, do us a solid by liking this video. Excuse me. <laughs> do us a like. Uh, like. You can do me a like by giving a like to this video, subscribing to the brand new channel if you haven't already, and clicking that sub uh, that bell so that you know when we post these daily videos. And uh, last but not least, uh, sharing the show with your pals. Let them know we're out here and that you're enjoying uh, the show that we do every week for you, and that you think uh, they might have a good time with us too. So with that, I guess that means it's time for... The news? News, what's up? <laughs> uh, pause. I just I need to write down the the time code here. Cool. <clears throat> All right. All right, so we've got a uh, pretty pretty hefty news list this week, guys, um, and uh, we're going to kick things off with some updates to some of last week's hottest stories. Uh, unfortunately, one of those is uh, uh, all about the, the fallout of the situation with Telltale Games and the uh, studio closure that led to, uh, you know, 200 plus, it was, I think it was 270 people when all said and done, uh, losing their jobs. Uh, obviously a horrible situation. We talked about it all last week in our main topic and went pretty in-depth on all the news that had been available at that time. Since then, there's been a few uh, update updates to the story. And uh, this is a thing we could talk about for another hour this week, frankly, but I don't, I don't want to do that um, because we gave so much attention to it last week. So I'm going to update you on the most important stuff. We'll talk about it. Thompson will get a chance to weigh in since he missed last week's discussion. Uh, and then, you know, we'll, we'll move on. So uh, just a few days after all this dust had kind of settled and, you know, we had already filed our story, you know, it, it seemed as though the writing was on the wall for the future of Telltale. Telltale uh, Games took to their Twitter account and put out what looks like a screenshot of them writing text into a Facebook post um, with an update around The Walking Dead. So this is, this is what the tweet reads. It's Like I said, it's a screenshot. So I'll link to it down below if you want to check it out for yourself. Hi, everyone. We have a Walking Dead update for you. Multiple potential partners have stepped forward to express interest in helping see the, the final season through to completion. While we can't make any promises today, we are actively working towards a solution that will allow episodes 3 and 4 to be completed and released in some form. In the meantime, episode 2 will release tomorrow uh, across all platforms as planned. We hope to have all... Excuse me. We hope to have answers for your other questions soon. So, uh, before I let you guys weigh on in this statement, this, uh, I think this was definitely a very polarizing statement where you saw a lot of people, uh, a lot of gamers who expressed excitement about this, right? Awesome. Maybe I'll get a chance to see a conclusion of the Walking Dead storyline that I've been following for all this time. I love Telltale Games. I'm just, I'm sad that they're closing. They'll get to finish their swan song. That's great news. 
Uh, and then the counterpoint to that argument was uh, expressed by a lot of fans as well as a lot of developers who were saying, okay, if you have that money, I hope that that means you have the money to pay these 200 plus people that you laid off and left with, uh, as we talked about last week, no severance, health care for only a, you know, a month uh, from where they were and left in the most expensive city in America. San Francisco, where they have obligations, I'm sure they have leases, all those things, right? Putting these people in a horrible situation. Uh, to highlight that position, I want to read a tweet from one Corey Balra, uh, Barlog. Excuse me. So if you don't know Corey, uh, Corey is the um, writer and director of the most previous God of War game. Uh, he's, you know, worked on the God of War series for a long time. Obviously, he's been in game development for, you know... Uh, decades at this point and um, I think he summed up this statement in a tweet that got a lot of traction has almost uh, over 2.5 thousand retweets and almost 18 thousand likes and Corey said I would hope this means that you will first pay your entire team their severance and then proceed to finish the final episodes I would be fine waiting however long it took to ensure that we first treated those who worked so hard with the humanity and respect they deserve so given that statement and um, Corey's reactions, I want to make one more reminder here um, from a tweet we didn't get a chance to read last week that also made a lot of, uh, a lot of rounds. And this was from uh, Brandon Sabenka, who was a Telltale, one of Telltale staffers that was laid off. He said, Re, I got laid off at Telltale. None of my sleepless nights or long hours on weekends trying to ship a game on time got me severance today. Don't work overtime unless you're paid for it, y'all. Protect your health. Companies don't care about you. So... Given these two positions, right, um, what do you guys think of this announcement? And I, I don't want to criticize the people who were excited by the prospect of, of, of The Walking Dead getting finished. I don't mean to sling shit at, at gamers for being excited about seeing the conclusion of their game, right? Um, let's just talk about about the announcement and how you, you feel about it. Um, I, I guess I'll go first. Uh, so I'm... I'm weighing the Corey Barlog, like, hope you're paying the people before you do this camp. But also, like, the that will allow episodes three and four to be released in some form. Like, it's going to be, like, a 45-minute long interactive comic. And nobody's going to like it. And I just don't see how this could be good for anybody. Yeah, that was one of my questions is who even makes this game? The team is gone. You think all those people are going to yep. just come back? Like, I mean, maybe some of them would uh, because obviously it's a tough world out there. They have, you know, like I said, they've got um, – I'm sure they have commitments that they need to pay bills for and everything. But I don't know. That seems crazy to me. Yeah. Like, I uh, just – I don't know who it's for. You don't know who who, who them releasing it is for? Like, I, and not who them releasing it. I don't know who it's gonna, like, actually satisfy. Um, who it's for is it's, it's for the people that spent money on the final season, like our own Pete and Bessie. Yeah, they owe me two episodes. <laughs> but I, I don't see how it can be satisfying. This is a tough one. Um, I, I mean, I think it's great that they're gonna you know, stand by their commitment of putting these games out so that people who pre-ordered or were looking forward to it will, you know, receive what it was that they paid for or have been looking forward to. At the same time, though, uh, I think that's a valid question of who is going to make this. Um, I think, you know, I, I don't see why people wouldn't come back and, and, and finish it. I mean, I understand that things didn't end great, but like you said, it is a job and it, it's, they probably would like to get paid. Um, so, but at the same time, I think anyone who gets a better opportunity would probably be better off taking that. Yeah, you'd I'm be only dumb really... not to take it. There's no future there now, you know? Right. I, I guess I'm only really talking about those who, you know, maybe haven't been reached out to yet or, you know, whatever, that opportunity hasn't come their way. Better to work on this than not have a job at all, I suppose. I mean, uh, I would agree with that, especially in game design, man, because it's one of those things where, like, when a studio closes, we talked about this last week, you see everybody kind of come together and try to help them relocate. 260 people are not going to find a job. No. You know? No. Uh, and, and maybe some of them go start their own studios. I'm not saying that all of these people are fucked, 
but it's the thing of if some of these people were like, I'm done with games, I'm going to go into something more stable or whatever, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, like there are, there are just redundancies, you know, like not every studio because uh, when we talked about it last week, you had made the point that not all of them are actually game developers. You know, they're not all people who sit and do code or whatever. Lots of them probably work at the desk, you know, or, or yeah. answer phones or whatever it is. And though not all of those people are going to find work. There are lots of redundancies. And and especially like I, I think like if you're a writer or you're a PR person, you're not somebody who is my job is to code games and you just had this experience where you're at this well established company, you had absolutely no warning, no severance, no healthcare, and you just got fucked. I would think about jumping ship to another industry too, of like, why don't I go do PR for some fucking comic book company or some fucking like i don't know some uh bay Bay area tech group or something like you something that's stable somewhere that where they're not going to just kick me out and then be like hey get the fuck out you can come back you know and have three hours to clean out your desk on sunday you know which is something else that telltale did um so i don't know like I, i think you're probably right though sean i think a decent number of these people would go back and finish it if they don't have something else lined up because it's it's a job and also i think even if you hate how telltale handled this that's not the walking dead's fault right like you started something i'm sure that a lot of these people are really upset that they're not getting to finish what they started and they're not getting to see their artistic vision through to the end yeah so uh andy thompson or andy you already said your piece thompson what do you think about this situation uh, it's a little weird that they close because their their you know formula is kind of stale enough. You know, people like the game, and, you know, they want to see it, but like obviously they took too many projects and like it's the same stuff over and over, and we've all lost kind of interest in this. And then they close, and then someone's like, "Oh well, yeah, well we're still gonna put them out anyway," and we had to fire everyone to do that. I don't know. That doesn't sit well with me. I'm totally on uh, Barlog's side. You know, it's just I. I I don't know if they were saying that they had enough of it done that they just need like a little bit more to get them out. Maybe. No, Tell-tales, yeah, that's the thing. Like know. they they would be like financing them because they're not made. Like I, we, uh, yeah. One but of I mean, the... like maybe they have scripts. You know, maybe they have like the the framework. Sure, yeah. That I think that stuff you know. is probably done. But in terms of like the game itself, there's like nothing. You know, right, like, right. Um, and the script isn't even probably done. It's probably like the top level, like, oh, here's what mm -hmm. happens, you know, but I doubt all the dialogues even written and everything like that. Cause they, I think they do them like as they're going, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Well, that's the thing, man. And so it just begs the question then, you know, who, who makes this, um, who finances it has the power to say that. And if you've already closed shop and everyone's out, you know, it, it stands the reason you could just get new people and even, you know, just cause they're the financiers people that they want to do. So um it this might be just a, like a pr stunt from the people at telltales you know leftovers saying like like hey anyone wants to pick this up you know maybe we could revive ourselves in the future or something that's kind of what i got from it but it does feel a little like early maybe <laughs> i don't know uh it's been like a few days you know yeah. i mean most, most people come out like uh you know like um radical heights you know is was dying and they're like yeah it's it's gonna die and then it was like a week or two later here's some pictures that might have been like whatever but like we're not gonna ask for money you know this is just like hey you don't want to make this for us you know <laughs> i don't know it i think it the most frustrating right. the most frustrating thing is like it feels very much like <clears throat> why i don't know because i know it, it's also come out since that the whole reason the company collapsed was because of a failed round of financing right mm-hmm, and right. like they we're gonna talk about that in a little bit but like they knew that was coming, right? Like they knew this, they could have warned their employees, they could have stopped hiring people. There's so many other ways they could have done it. But I think the most Mm -hmm. damning thing is that in 2018, in the age of the Kickstarter, of Patreon, of all that stuff, that they didn't just nut up and be like, hey, we've fallen on hard times. We're gonna, like, we need money. People would have, like, I don't know. It, it, It seems like the fact that you're now shopping around for another partner now that everybody's fired and fucked is like well i don't i don't want you to come back now you know like let's like just it, let it, it really felt like they had a better way to do all this obviously from the ground up you know like if they're tanking like obviously you know you don't panic as soon as you lose a little money but when they're in the scenario where they have to shut down there was a step where someone must have realized this is not you know viable anymore and if people really believe in our stuff you know um kickstarter or any kind of other project service out there could have helped or even 
just telling the fans like maybe people are sleeping on these games waiting for it to come out all four episodes you know maybe there is a a base of people that would just eat this shit up if it was all out at once and they're just waiting for the whole thing i know i do that with a lot of those types of games so they could even say like hey guys like we really need you to buy episode one or episode two or like because you know we don't have the money to make the future games so we build these on the you know they could have told any those they could have even been just to the public more open about yeah. that problem instead of just closing up you know it doesn't sound like they were open with anyone no it doesn't what and that's the like? problem if you had maybe <laughs> one facet on any angle you might have had something work out better you know my so last week i defended telltale in the sense of trying to present the other side of the argument because it felt like the conversation surrounding all of this was very much like you know let's armchair quarterback but i i like i do want to say that in my mind, there's absolutely no way that when they fired those people is exactly when they knew no. that things were going south. And if I have a problem with how it was handled, that is my biggest problem. Um, it's that they could have done more for those people. Oh, right, yeah. And they right, chose right, yeah. not to. Uh, if, if they had to close, it's whatever. I don't know if Severance was in their contract um you know these things happen all of that is what it is but to not give them the opportunity to know ahead of time what's coming is completely unprofessional and it shows a lack of consideration on their part for the employees who are the people who made the games yep absolutely man and i and uh to build on that like there's also like the issue it's come out right that they were hiring people up up until you know a few weeks ago like what? they're they're bringing more people on yeah, yeah. onto a sinking ship that's, because that's they were the like, thing, oh, yeah. well, we're going to get financing. We're going through this round of financing, and it's like you don't. They didn't oh, know that. You know what they I mean? They thought they thought money was coming. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and like that's all well and good, but again, like stop hiring people. Like stop. You know, like there's so many other places they could have cut these corners, right? And not and, and tried to stop the bleeding. Uh, and Absolutely. and they clearly didn't, you know, and then they just kept pushing on with reckless abandon. And like you said, it shows a clear lack of care about what was going to happen if so, if stuff went belly up and not caring about where those people were going to end up. Uh, and because of that, that is going to take us into um, the the rest of the story, which is the update around the lawsuit that Telltale is now going to be involved in by their former employees. Uh, so I have two articles here from gamesindustry.biz that uh, talk about kind of the pro-union argument and the lawsuit that has come out of this. And uh, I'm not great with um, law, so I'm going to you know let let these articles uh, let these articles explain the story to you, and then we can we can comment. So our first one is uh, from the editor in chief over at gamesindustry.biz, Matthew uh, Handron who writes, uh, it's Telltale's treatment of staff, quote, a problem endemic in the industry. Pro-union group Game Workers Union Unite lambasts Telltale for cutting staff with no severance pay or health care. The pro-union organization Games Worker Unite has categorized the treatment of laid-off staff at Telltale as, quote, a problem endemic in the industry. In a post on its website, Game Workers Unite criticized Telltale for leaving a reported 225 people in the position of being, quote, denied pay and health care without notice or severance, left vulnerable in an area with an extremely high cost of living. It also noted that, quote, some of those workers were just recently hired. These claims are consistent with reports, mostly on Twitter, from members of staff who were affected by extensive layoffs uh, at the studio last week. And then we have the quote from uh, Sabenka that we read earlier about his severance, how companies don't care about you. Uh, we re- Last week, we read um, some of the tweets from uh, the narrative designer, Emily Grace Buck, who we talked about. Um, and here they just – they kind of uh, – summarize some of her other tweets that have come out since then. So narrative designer Emily Grace Buck offered even more detail, suggesting that the actual number of layoffs was closer to 250 people and that and reiterating that there was no severance pay or health care beyond a single week. Uh, so it was actually a week, not a month, excuse me. Uh, she supported the claim that some employees had started, quote, as recently as a week ago, unquote. With at least, <laughs> think, with at think le- any of those people moved out? Just well, to, for that job. Here's what she said. With at least one, quote, having relocated cross-country. 
Unbelievable. Somebody <laughs> uprooted their life and moved to San Francisco, the most wow. expensive, the Bay Area, the most expensive place to live in America, uh, only to be fired a week later. So due to the insanely high cost of living in the Bay Area relative to pay scale, many of my colleagues were living paycheck to paycheck and do not know what they are going to do to make ends meet this month, she added. Game Workers Unite, which was established to further the cause of unionizing the games industry, described Telltale's executives as incompetent and exploited, <laughs> exploitative based on the nature of the studio's decline and its treatment of its workforce. It also referenced an article from The Verge in March this year, which painted a troubling picture of the studio's internal culture, which is something we've also talked about in the past. This problem is not isolated to only Telltale or the executives there. This is a problem that we see time and time again throughout the industry. Excuse me. And we will continue to see as long as management is able to take advantage of workers, the statement read. Just within the past month, we've seen three major studio closures. The system for creating games is broken and it will result in the collapse of many other beloved studios in the future. So uh, obviously, you know, that, that that's some pretty, some pretty serious uh, statements from them. And I think... Looking into the uh, story that was filed a day later by Rebecca Valentine, former Telltale employee sues staff for labor law violations and mass layoff, speaks to the fact that it seems like they certainly have a case here. So a class action lawsuit has been filed against Telltale Games in the wake of a sudden mass layoff. We know this. Uh, so Polygon reports that the lawsuit submitted by former Telltale employee Vernie Roberts accuses the company of violating the Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification WARN Act when it was terminated, the, when it terminated the majority of its staff without warning or severance and benefits lasting only until the end of the month. The WARN Act requires employees be notified at least 60 days in advance of mass layoffs or the closure of a work location such as a plant or in the case of game development a studio. In its federal form, a company may be exempt uh, from this if it is either currently seeking funding or if the, t if the layoffs occurred during an unforeseen business change. This exemption does not exist at, at the California state level where Telltale is located and under which it falls. The suit alleges Telltale was in violation of both federal and state law. In an interview with Game Daily, attorney Richard Hogg of Hogg Law said that while Telltale may be able to exempt itself at the federal level due to the, quote, unforeseen business circumstances clause, the state level would prove trickier to avoid. By keeping the company open in some capacity, it would appear that Telltale had foreclosed itself from using the most obvious exception to the Warn Acts, Hogg said. That is, uh, that is unlikely to have a significant negative effect on its ability to comply with the federal act, but the fact that California did not bring over the pertinent exemption would seem to put them on a precarious compliance position with the state, as there is no obviously applicable exception to the 60-day requirement that I can see from the outside. Should the lawsuit succeed, um, Telltale would be liable for back pay and benefits for all the affected employees for each day the company was in violation of the act, according to the suit in this case, a full 60 days. Uh, so then there's just a little bit more. It says that it uh, the suit is actually for 275 people because it also includes the 25 remaining people who are in the skeleton crew that are there working on the Minecraft story mode. Um, so obviously that's a lot of info, but I think um, the the tragic thing here is even though it seems like they have a case, I don't, I can't help but think this is going to just be an argument of principle because even if they win the lawsuit. Does Telltale even have the money left to pay all these people their severance and 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 you know comply with this, or are they just going to file for bank file for bankruptcy and get off scot free? Uh, they they probably file for bankruptcy and get off scot free. But they're they're currently producing games. I, I don't understand if they're yeah. if they're producing games and theoretically will make money off of those games. They'll have income. In which case, wouldn't that then have to go by law to the people who they um, who they harmed by not complying with with the state law. It's it's weird because you like you look at like the the situation like they have the skeleton crew of twenty five people left that are finishing the Minecraft thing so that they meet that contractual ob obligation with Netflix, right? I wonder if that money's already owed somewhere else. You but, know? but I, I mean, I'm I'm talking about the Walking Dead. They're, oh. they're they're making that. Well, right? they, but so, that's the thing we don't know. Like they said, the thing like partners have expressed interest in them making Walking Dead three and four or whatever. That's the question, right? If they find a partner, does that partner's money immediately get taken? And uh, like, what's the term that they use um, when they take money from your checks and stuff? Um, garnish. Garnished. Yeah. Is that money going to yeah. be garnished and given to the 
you know, highest level employees that were fucked and then they'll trickle it down as far as it'll go or, or, or are they not going to be even allowed to enter that kind of, uh, or, or are these partners going to pull out now because of the lawsuit? Like who knows, right? This, it sounds to me like this conversation is really like beyond the scope of what we can really discuss with, um, with knowledge. But there was something in this that I thought was really interesting. Uh, so if I could highlight it. Yeah. Um, so in Matthew's article, at the end, it says, it's a quote, but I'm not sure who it's from. I guess it's from the Verge article. Just within the past month, we've seen three major studio closures. The system for creating games is broken, and it will result in the collapse of many other beloved studios in the future. That was from now, the uh, the Pro Union group, the Game, okay. game, game Workers Unite. Right. That is really interesting to me because I don't understand what the solution is supposed to be. So outline like I need the problem and the solution to both be outlined because to me that statement doesn't make any sense. If the like what is the problem with how games are being developed? And how does that lead to studio closure? Um so the, the problem, as I understand it from the labor perspective, is games are developed on razor-thin margins by uh, working staff, like, 80-hour weeks in the month before a release. And uh, because of the industry's reluctance to uh, change price points and everybody always wanting to, like, to get out get like the most value from their employees it sets up these small studios like telltale or i forget who the other major studios were uh, uh, the well, dead rising studio right capcom vancouver yeah it's it sets it up so that like one or two bad projects leads to 300 people losing their jobs right okay great that's what i that's what i assumed um so what is the so th- what is the way to solve that problem? That you mentioned the price point. I agree with you, but I don't really see that changing. And I I think that the eighty hour work weeks is insane, and I can't imagine why people do that. But um, that's a separate issue in my mind from why studios have to close. Yeah, because it doesn't sound like these people even get paid overtime. So it's not like they're no. even making. No. They're no, not making. They get- you know, an inordinate amount of money that's then draining cash from the studio. So focusing on the actual studio and why they close, they don't make enough money if the game does poorly, like what we talked about last week with uh, how, you know, Wolf Among Us didn't make, it was a great game, but it didn't make a ton of money, and that that really hurts uh, Telltale. This is something that happens all the time. So what is the solution? If you You can't force people to buy your game. So how do you solve that problem? I think I, – oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Andy. Oh, I, I like, genuinely don't know. Right. And that's the problem. But as, yeah. it stands, as it stands right now, the the only way the games industry is as big as it is, um, at least as far as I've seen, is it thrives on hiring and then overworking young people who are romantic about video games. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. It's an ex- so, like, I think that's part of the labor uh, unions people, you know – Oh, it's absolutely. exploitative yeah. shit, and I don't see the answer though because it doesn't matter uh, what you want to try to change. A small studio, even with the best practices, if they don't make money, they're not going to be in the the league. And if you don't exactly. make one good game, that could be it. And it's not a matter of you just being shitty or not like telling your employees or whatever. It's just maybe you just didn't make enough from the last one, or maybe yep. anything. And it, unfortunately, the answer is like per studio. Right, now, right. I think the only thing is that they just want to have better work practices across everything, which I totally get. But I don't see that changing the industry. Even. That's exactly just treat what I people mean. correctly yep. isn't going to make studios not collapse. So I think I think the thing is though with because I I think so. Okay, uh, I think what you guys are saying is is a really salient point, and I think that you're right that at the end of the day, the nature of creative endeavors is that some will fail. And there's no amount of 
uh, legislation or or anything. There's nothing a union can do about if your studio isn't making games that connect with people, you're not going to survive. That's all well and good. But I think the difference is it's one thing if it's a small indie studio of a few professionals who are like, we're going to band together and make this and put all our money into it. And if it works, we succeed. And if it doesn't, we, we die. And, and that's what it is. It's different when it's Telltale, which is a, you know, we call them a small studio because they make small games, but they weren't. They employed over 250 people. And the fact that they had income, I think the categorization of their management as incompetent and irresponsible is absolutely accurate. And the fact that we had those people do that, um, and that that is generally par for the course, that many studios end up in that situation where it is mismanaged, the company has plenty of money, but they're not required to treat their workers with respect, so they don't. And I think that's where this is really important. Um, But to your point, Sean, the angle of how does that save you from studio closures, I think management of resources is a thing. Because you look at a company like EA, and we talked about like the Visceral closing earlier this year and, and stuff like that. I'm not saying that they should have, oh, well, Visceral's not making money. If Visceral doesn't make money, you close the studio. That's totally legitimate. I'm not arguing against that point. But you look at how many executive level people they are that are making more money than they need to at a studio. If the studio isn't turning a profit, guess what your executive should do? Take a pay cut. You know who did that? Awada for Nintendo. When Nintendo hit its least profitable point during the Wii U era, he took a pay cut so that the, the so that his workers wouldn't suffer. So that Nintendo didn't have to lay people off. And I That's, and yeah. that it's a principled position. I not everyone's going to do that, but it's the thing is like there needs to be there needs to be at a company of that size, you need to have some level of protection for your workers. And that's not going to d- guarantee your survival, but it's going to guarantee like that you don't have people being taken advantage of. And I think like that's enough. But that's but that's not okay, so that's not a legal argument, right? Because a lot of choosing to do that is not that's that was his choice, and nobody else has to make that choice, right? And I think that there's a there's a level of um, being on this side of the fence where we're making no money in comparison to someone who's making millions of dollars where sure. it's easy to say, yeah, I'll t- I would do that. I would take a pay cut. You know, I would say that right now. But if I were making millions, I might not I might not then feel that way. Um, so there's that. But then there's also the factor of, OK, the companies are mismanaged. It is not illegal to be a shitty businessman in the sense of not knowing how to run a business well right that's you know in america you can make i mean across the country across the world you can make a business and whatever happens is on you as long as you do things legally and that does not fall under the scope of legality it also doesn't fall, fall under the scope of in my eyes what a union can control as long as you're talking about people being treated uh fairly within within respect of what is within the union right so the company being mismanaged and not knowing how to how to operate and 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 how to handle its money doesn't have anything to do with how the workers are being treated unless they're being treated poorly which is a which is a problem across the entire industry yes. but doesn't have anything to do with these games not succeeding so my so that that brings me back to my initial question how do you solve the problem of these companies not making up enough money to sustain themselves if they put out a game that doesn't do well enough. I think, this is just my opinion, there are too many games. I genuinely feel like that. There are too many games. The industry is way too big for its britches. $60 is a lot of money, okay? The film industry can barely sustain itself off of between $9 and $16 a ticket for an average ticket, Okay? There are too many games, and this is what happens. The market's too big for the amount of people who actually exist in it and buy games. I, I think you're right to some point, man, uh, or to some degree anyway, yeah, because I think like you look at – we talked about with, with Capcom Vancouver, right? The closure there was that Dead Rising was successful but not successful enough, and I don't – I think that's true, and there's nothing wrong with that, and I think the the whole – to your point about the scope of what – the unions should exist to achieve is just is literally in my mind just to act on the workers behalf if they're being treated poorly or if management is so incompetent that they're putting their livelihood in jeopardy 
And that's fine because at the end of the day, you're right. It's not illegal to mismanage your company wrong if you don't break the law. But I think there sh- there needs to be groups that act on the worker's behalf because at the end of the day, the law is built in the favor of the business owner, not the worker. And right. especially in, in an industry uh, – and we talk about this in comics all the time, right? Like any creative industry where you can take advantage of the fact that there are people that have passion, that – all they've ever wanted to do, do with their life is make video games and they're willing to work 80 hours a week and make $35,000 a year and live in the Bay Area, right. you know, um, which is not sustainable. And we, I think we as a community of, of both, you know, consumers, creators, and uh, I don't mean this derisively, but profiteers should ideally want to work towards a future where, Profits are maximized as much as they can be without treating the artists like, you know, um, like, like like shit, like shit, but also like they're in, like they're disposable cogs in a machine because they're not. They're like you said uh, about Telltale. Those are the people that made the money. They made the art that was successful. And I'm not I'm not discrediting the finance people, the PR people. Those people are all incredibly important. And I, I don't mean to, oh, the devs are the most, but it's, it's the thing is the workers are the people that's important. The workers are the ones making the company successful, not the... It starts there. Yeah, not just the executives. And the executives are important too. A bad executive will ruin a fucking company and a good executive can save one. But you can't take advantage of those people. You can't exploit those people. Uh, it's you are right. I think it was Andy though, and this is my last point. I think it was Andy who said that these companies subsist off of abuse of workers and if they couldn't do that they would fold a lot faster and that is not me defending the abuse that's me saying that there is a really big there's a big problem when you can't keep your company afloat unless you can treat people almost like slaves and that's a crazy problem in the, in the industry yeah and i, I think yeah. the point is is i don't even know that it's an issue of that there i think there are too many games right but i don't think it's an issue that there's too many studios and they can't all survive i think it's that they're all many of them are poorly managed and that they don't manage expectations is that if you have an ip like a dead rising or something like that that has resonance but isn't the game that's going to sell eight million copies don't make it for that money Make a smaller, yep. scaled back version, charge less money, find where you can exist and succeed. Because Maybe they can't see- afford to. If you can, right? And I'm not saying everybody can. You're right. It's easy to be an armchair quarterback when I'm not doing this shit. But I look at people who have done it, and like you look at a, a studio like Double Fine, right? That was in a shit position, back was up against the wall, looked like they were going to fold. What did they do? They went to Kickstarter. They said, hey, this is our vision. This is who we are. If you believe in it, back us. Get our back. We're going to make the kinds of games that we like to make, that you want to play, that nobody else wants to gamble on, and let's do that, and let's live in that space and succeed in that space. And they have. And not everybody's double fine. Not everybody has Tim Schafer or or that that level of leadership who are actual game designers as well as people that are decent with money or putting people who are good with money that give a shit in the right positions. I get it that those are unique situations, but my point is it's not impossible. It's not impossible to have your studio survive at a smaller level. You look at the Hitman studio. uh, I think IO Interactive, who just got let go from Square, took their IP and they're doing AAA level games in their own way, doing the episodic thing, selling them for less money. That can work. You have to be smart, though, and you need to put the right people in place. And maybe you don't have that luxury. Maybe you don't have that talent. But if you don't, take your shot. At the very least, don't fuck the people that got you there, the people that you brought along for the ride, because you owe them something. If you have people relocating their lives to come work for you, you owe them a safety net. You owe them the courtesy of two weeks' notice, a month's notice, whatever you can do. As soon as you know that the company is in jeopardy, you should be letting these people know. That should be That should be a law. And it is, right? We see. That's why there's this lawsuit. But what the fuck? Who knows if these people are even going to see a cent at this point? Because is there any money left in Telltale's coffers? And that's the sad truth, is that at, at, at best, these people will see some money. At worst, hopefully, at least it's a fucking... It's a, it's a thing that is like a, uh, a signal to developers in the future to not do this shit. To handle it better. I agree with, to- I agree with everything you just said. 
or to move to states that aren't California. That's another really good point. Exist. Hey, yeah, there's a great point that none of us brought up. If you can't afford to operate your business in the Bay Area, fucking move somewhere else. You're, you don't, yeah. Your studio doesn't need to be in California. I know that's like the hub of game development, but... Doesn't have to be. No. Like, yeah. uh, there are plenty of studios in the UK, in Canada, in... You know, like all like fucking the Northwest, like all over the fucking place where rent is way cheaper and they're able to make bigger games for for less money. You know, seriously, I don't I don't know. I I understand. And like I live in Washington, D.C., right? It's a it's a huge city. It's very expensive. But like, I don't understand these companies that like set up in the Bay Area when they can't afford to be there. And I understand that like makes me kind of a hypocrite, but you can get so much land for like $12 in the Midwest. Yeah. And not only that, but like some of these companies, you know, say like a 10 person company in the Bay Area could afford to like literally buy like five trailers on cheap land and hook up like all these people with houses too. With the amount of fucking money they're spending on rent. It doesn't need to be just cause it's there. You can, you, you could just save a lot of cash, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, if you're and, worried about like not meeting the right people and you're like oh we need to tech demo something well fucking buy a plane ticket and go out there with that you could say you would still save money you yeah know like you could still save money by like flying out your pr people to california when it's time to do press stuff or if you need to meet with somebody or whatever um but it's nuts man uh it's nuts how this whole thing played out and it's really it's truly a shame mm. um but i guess to leave things on a slightly positive note uh if if you like um like we cautiously were at least uh interested in the idea of a stranger things video game uh netflix has made a follow-up statement that um they plan to move forward on their 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 uh, stranger things game somewhere so here was their quote we are ve we are saddened by the news about telltale games they developed many great games in the past and left an indelible mark on the industry Minecraft story mode is still moving forward as planned, and we are in the process of evaluating other options for bringing Stranger Things, the Stranger Things universe, to an interactive medium. So, if you're a Stranger Things fan, hope springs eternal, and uh, hopefully, I, I, I had the idea. I would love to see Netflix pull some bullshit like they did with Mark Millar, where they're like, "Yo, Netflix Game Factory, bitch," and they hire like a hundred of these Telltale people and just be like, "Let's put out games based on Netflix properties." So. Yeah. Fingers crossed. I hope, yeah, I hope something cool. comes of that. that. I think that would be a match made in heaven, man. Um, just give it to Don't Nod. Please, just give it to Don't Nod. Or Deck Nine. Give it to Deck Nine. They need they need a gig now. They're done with the uh, Life is Strange prequel. They're ready Wait, for the next it. project. Let's go. I got it, Pete. I know you're going to be behind this 100%. Hit me. Stranger Things, the video game. Developed and published by Platinum. <sighs> you know, I knew you were going to say that. And I still, I was like, you know, maybe Andy's going to really hit me with a hot take that's going to excite me. Nope. No. What about Done by Arcane Studios? Stranger Things the video game by Arcane. Yes. Sign the immersive the fuck up. sim of the upside down. I'm into it. Yes. 100%. All right. So moving right along, uh, we've got another story here that's a, a slight update from last week where uh, we talked about um, the, I guess, potential new Pokemon at the time. By the time the episode got out, it had already been confirmed as real. So here we are reporting the news for you late once again. But uh, Meltan is going to be the new legendary Pokemon that you can get only in Pokemon Go. Uh, wow. So we talked about that all last week and everything. I'll, I'll, you know, spare you those details. If you want to go check it out, you can listen to last week's show. But essentially, they released a video on Twitter from the Pokemon company that had uh, Professor Willow, who's the professor from Pokemon Go, talking to uh, Professor Oak, and they were talking all about Meltan and how he appeared in these ancient texts. He's a mythical Pokemon, that kind of stuff. Uh, so here, here's the actual updates. So Meltan is classified as the Hexnut Pokemon. It's a pure steel type with a fluid, amorphous body made of liquid... Oh, I'm sorry, and this comes from GameSpot's article on the subject. Excuse me. Um, this is by uh, Kevin Kesniak. Real, real quick, I like yeah. that from the ancient texts in the ancient world they had hex nut technology. Yeah, in the that's... ancient world they had nuts and bolts, I guess. Yeah, that's like that's really saying something, man. Uh, this is also pretty interesting. Uh, so according to the official Pokemon website, Meltan can use its arms and legs to corrode and absorb metal. It can also generate electricity, which it uses both in battle and as a source of energy. So why isn't it an electric type? What what type is it? It's just mono steel. 
If it has if it has electric powers, it's insulated. Mentioned in yeah, but like I don't know. I thought that was weird. Um, it itself is a very advanced machine, and its electricity bursts only are its like power source. Maybe it's like a fucking <laughs> cyborg or something. I'm getting too deep into this. Keep going. I'm done. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's you know it's it's pretty simple. Like you can go check out. We've got pictures down below. Um, and then they say here it's like it's not clear how players will be able to obtain Meltan, but as the Pokemon Company previously teased, you'll need to connect Pokemon Go to Let's Go Pikachu or Let's Go Eevee if you want to get it in the game. Well, so, they really are, are getting you on those games, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know what's up with that. Uh, exactly. It seems as though basically you'll be able to catch it in-game and transfer it over just like you could with any other Pokemon from Let's Go. So it seems pretty standard. Uh, but obviously this is kind of interesting. Like, I thought this is a, a really... Oh, <coughs> ooh, excuse me. Um, I thought this was a really interesting marketing move, you know, to try and get people back into Go as it were, but uh, it's certainly, it's a little annoying. I really don't want to download Go again to catch this damn Pokemon, but I'm a Mark, <laughs> so obviously I'm going to do it. And then you're going to also transfer it to your, your Let's Go uh, Eevee or whatever edition you're getting. Yeah. Or any, yeah, I mean. That's why yeah, I have to do it. That's kind of cool. So are you getting it? Yeah, I have to. Which one are you getting? The I'm going to get Eevee. That's blue. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's the thing. Is it's Eevee like, blue? Yeah, it's the blue version. It's got the same exclusive Pokemon, and if you think about it, like, from a purely, like, lore standpoint, which, lol, but, uh, red has a Pikachu and blue has an Eevee. So. Okay. Um, yeah, but, like, yeah, I decided I have to buy it. Like, I, if I want to, first of all, we'll play it on Pals Play, so that, we'll make content about it. And, like, I've complained about it so fucking much, and I'm, like, a Pokemon guy, you know? So it's, like, how can I how can I have an opinion about it if I don't even give it a try, you know? And, yeah, like... You can have a point in your life when you realize that something isn't for you and still be a Pokemon guy. That's the thing. If I, <laughs> if I wasn't a critic, I would, I would do that. You know, like, I'd be like, this isn't for me, I'm not going to pick it up. But, like, the fact that we're going to be talking about these games, and I've lambasted them almost every time they come up, I, I feel like it's only fair that I give them a fair shake and see how I feel about them, you know? I think for me, Does... it's going to be more fun to not play the Let's Go's and just still shit on it. That's funny. <laughs> so, the, the, Does like... that also mean, Pete, that you're going to play Death Stranding? Well, we're, we're, I'm, he's going to have to play it because I'm going to have it because it's a Kojima game, so... Same way he's gonna suffer, you know, me through the the Let's Go stuff on Pals Play. I'm I'm gonna have to make him play Death Stranding. Same way you're gonna play The Last of Us, Pete. You're doing it eventually. Well, see, I want to play The Last of Us. The thing with Death Stranding, you're, you're playing I, it. I don't care. Jury's out <laughs> on, on that, Sean, because in you're five it. years, we're gonna play six the, years, the Venom. We're gonna play the Venom crossover movie title game. That's gonna be amazing. You stop it. Yeah, <laughs> I get enough of this on the comics, pals. Thompson, this is where I go to get away from Venom. Uh, but to answer your question, Sean, um, I, I think it like, oh wait, shit, damn it, I got lost in the question. What was the question? The question was, will you play Death Stranding for the oh, same? Oh, sorry, years? will I play Death Stranding? Uh, I in five to six years, when Death Stranding finally comes out, and I have an idea of what it looks like, maybe I'll be interested in it. <laughs> <laughs> Jury's out on that one, though. <laughs> You're optimistic. Five to six years. Wow. Yeah. Um. It's well. You see, it's about Norman Reedus's character, uh, Plasma Python. It's a stealth game about <laughs> carrying <laughs> babies. Oh, it's just Metal Gear Solid, but with all the but with know, fetuses. I, I, well, Pete can't play that because then he might be tempted to punch the children. Exactly. Whoa, 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 whoa. I did not advocate punching fetuses. I advocated punching 10-year-olds. That's different. Mm. Listen, in the world of Pokemon, a 10-year-old is old enough to go on an adventure by their own and cockfight atomic monsters. I feel like they can take a punch to the face. But were you talking about the world of Pokemon 10-year-olds or were you talking about real-world 10-year-olds? Andy, Pete? you are supposed to be my lawyer in this situation. Yeah. Do not incriminate is me. Is he? I think he's. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 think, think, I think you I promo think him as your prosecution. antagonist. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's not my fault that I do a bad job of picking counsel. Yeah, I, I think in this situation, you're Phoenix Wright and I'm Miles Edgeworth. <laughs> uh, isn't Thompson Miles Edgeworth just because Edge? Edge. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, while we're on the subject of Pokemon Let's Go, 
uh, we got another little update here about the motion controls in the game. Apparently, they will not be required uh, to play the game, but there is a bit of a caveat there. So this comes from an article, again, from IGN by uh, Casey DeFritas. For De 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 DeFritas. Sorry, Casey. It's from Casey DeFritas. Uh, so this is what Casey had to say about it. Uh, contrary to previous reports, motion controls are not required to catch Pokemon while playing Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee in handheld mode, according to a statement from Nintendo. However, there are still many lingering questions about how that process will actually work, and it's important to point out that he said handheld mode. Um, but here's the full statement that uh, IGN got from a Nintendo representative on the subject. Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee do not require players to use motion controls or physical gestures when in handheld mode. Instead, players can use the joystick on the left Joy-Con controller to aim and press A uh, to throw a Pokeball. The simulated throwing motion associated with the Joy-Con controllers or Pokeball Plus is intended to enhance the gameplay experience, but are not required to play these games. Uh, and then... They also had like a, a, a follow-up confirmation where they said, quote, there is no function to turn off motion controls, but quote, this does not impact that the does not impact that player's ability to use the buttons and joysticks to play the game in handheld mode. So it sounds like motion controls are always on, but you're able to use just the joysticks when you're in handheld mode specifically. Hmm. Which is um yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting. So it, it definitely it, it doesn't it says right here, right, it's unclear if the motion controls will kick in automatically when the system is moved while Pokemon Let's Go is played in handheld mode or, or how exactly it's going to work. But it seems that if you're playing in handheld mode, you will have an option to avoid Yeah, right. Th that somehow. kind of makes sense, actually, if you think about it. If you're in handheld mode, right? How the hell would you do it? No, I mean, if you're in it, right, you can't throw it. I mean, and you have the things attached, right? So it probably uses some kind of like... Let's uh, your Switch. No, you know what I mean? So the motion is probably something like having it, um, you know, flat that you can like kind of roll it around to try to like, you know, aim it that way. So they're probably just saying like, as you're doing that, you probably have to use the stick to guide it. And it's like, fuck it, just use the stick, you know, like it, it kind of, that kind of sucks still, but you have to, you have to do it the other way though. Cause if it's not handheld, I mean, I don't know. It's like, it would be nice to have it on like the TV and not have to like throw constantly. I think the motion controls are dumb, but that's just me. Yeah, I I don't know. I'm hoping that I'm hoping that there's some way to do that. Like maybe you are able to just use it that way. Period. But the the specific calling out of handheld mode makes me think that that's really not. Oh, that's that's anything. exactly what I'm thinking too. Yeah, which is unfortunate. But uh, just for summary here, right at the end of the article, because there's there's a lot more here. If you want to go get all of the nitty gritty, they have like um a, they have some talks about how they played a demo and like how that what their experience was like and some speculation. But they did a little wrap up at the end of the article here. So in summary, here's what we learned about motion controls in Pokemon Let's Go while in handheld mode. At the start of a Pokemon catching encounter, the only input needed is choosing an item and pressing the A button to throw a Pokeball. No motion controls required. This is easily accomplished if the switch is completely stationary such as when flat on a table if you want you can move the camera while in a catching encounter with the left joystick though there is no obvious reason to do so however motion controls cannot be turned off so if the switch is in handheld mode so if the switch in handheld mode is physically moved the movement would trigger the motion controls causing the camera to move with it so in conclusion, motion controls are not necessary to catch a Pokemon in Pokemon Let's Go when in handheld mode. However, moving the console would trigger motion controls. So that's super weird. It's kind of like I think what I was saying, where it's like if you have it flat and you move it, it'll it'll aim the the camera for you. So that's you know if if it starts moving if instead of being just stationary, it's gonna have to activate some some other way. So I don't it's gonna BS though. I think this, it sounds to me like this game is intended to be a motion control operated game. Yeah. And fine. Um, it's just weird that they're that they're telling you that there's a workaround, but that it doesn't really work. So, just like Nintendo, it, man. Yeah, it's, just say it's... just say <laughs> what it is and call it a day, you know? It's it's or, like, when they, you know, they launched the Switches online, not this, like, the first thing, and they're like, there's no audio, whatever, like, it, they just were like, whatever, fun workaround, you know, it's like dumb, they do that kind of shit all the time, you know, like, every, it just, it just feels classic Nintendo, man, you know? It's classic Nintendo. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, oh, no, wait, Eddie. If, I'm sorry to Pete, and to a lesser extent, Thompson, but if, if Nintendo's gotta pick one of its you know, 
A-list franchises to be classic Nintendo about. I'm glad it's Pokemon. You're trash. <laughs> I, I also love how I was discounted. I'm a huge Pokemon fan. I guess I just don't wear my yeah, stuff on really. my sleeve. I, mean, I love Pokemon. Yeah, I mean, you don't you don't come through with the hot water Pokemon or good takes every day like that. That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Sean was my only ally in this fight for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> not not your ally i'm just saying well that's a fact yeah it's, it's, it's just a fact when you're a pokemon person you start becoming a numbers kind of guy you know and, yeah. and and you look at numbers and you look at one category and you happen to notice water is a lot of that cat and you're just like i'm not saying anything bad about water but they're kind of bad you know you just <laughs> happen to notice that statistically it's one of the best competitive types in the game that's totally fine yeah no big deal no, no, yeah, you know, I mean, facts. You know, no just, yeah I you can... could you could probably play a type like poison which is you know only guy yeah, you can 1v6 introduce... you can 1v6 a water team at one poison you know it's like that, oh, that yeah, happens yeah yeah it's that really happens. yeah yeah you do that one time and you brag about it for the you next do it twice. six years you do it twice. yeah that right. happened whoa 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 because <laughs> Pete couldn't beat one Pokemon with his whole water team. And yeah, and Thompson likes to selectively forget all the times that I did the same thing to his whack ass. I'm just saying the fact that you're you couldn't top- touch my slow bro, brother. Couldn't touch my slow bro. That's all I gotta say. I just say, man, you brought a team and you're like, oh, what's this one guy? I'm gonna i I'm gonna fucking body this one chump. And Dude. nah. I, I got You opened my eyes to the value of Toxicroak. Toxicroak is I'm a saying. fucking G, and he has dry skin. That's really good against the water team. All right, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not saying that you're trash. I'm just saying your takes about Pokemon types are trash. Okay, listen. <laughs> so my first pick. I jumped into this league when you guys were like, you got poison and you got a uh, bug, and I'm like, okay, uh, I'll take poison, <laughs> I guess. So. So, you know, I made do with what I had, and then I came out with a, with a fucking 1v6 twice, and I'm like, okay, poison, yeah, like, I hate poison, <laughs> but it's fucking good now to me, and so it's all I got, man. So, <laughs> it, I just want to clarify, I'm not saying, like, I want Pokemon to, like, be get fucked up, it's just, like, if Nintendo has to fuck up its franchise by being an idiot about things. <laughs> no, I want Pokemon. It's like, I'd rather it be Pokemon than, like, Mario or Zelda. I want Pokemon to go in the blender and come out the other side of an abomination so they can get their values and, and hey. like make a fucking baller-ass Pokemon game for the ages. Listen, everybody's got to get their Skyward Sword before they can have their Breath of the Wild. Right, that's, that's what I'm saying. Very true. So if this is going to happen on dumb Pokemon Let's Go, you know, Eevee Edition, let it happen, whatever. You know, like, it's not like it's going to bomb. It's just like, if this is what makes them, like, if if it does kind of do a little bit, you know, sour, then maybe we'll get something great. The funny thing is, this game will almost certainly do gangbusters. So of course, I mean, we'll it's not gonna. Yeah, it's gonna make money. That's so, the problem. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, like the worst but, Disney movie made, you know, bajillion dollars. So. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I just wanted to give you guys a little update on that story and and fill you in on the motion control stuff. We'll have more to say about Pokemon Let's Go in November when it comes out. Um, and I'm sure there'll be more announcements about it in the next couple weeks because that's how Nintendo do. It'll be a Nintendo Direct. <laughs> maybe but if if not even just the pokemon company's been putting shit out on twitter like every week you know so it's like there'll be stuff to pick up yeah, yeah um but anyway so moving into the world of playstation uh sony has finally backed down on uh cross play and uh as of this week um fortnite's cross play beta is live so uh this is obviously a huge huge change from it's a big step yeah their position yeah. of PlayStation is the best place to play, and it doesn't matter that we're fucking our consumers. So uh, this is obviously a huge turn for them, but um, you know I think uh, obviously a good one. So I'm going to read the uh, PlayStation blog post here, and uh, from uh, John Codera, who's the president and global CEO of Sony Inter- Interactive Entertainment. Uh, following a comprehensive evaluation process, SIE has identified a path toward supporting cross-platform features for select third-party content. We recognize that PS4 players have been eagerly awaiting an update, and we appreciate the community's continued patience. I don't know if I'd call it that, as we have navigated through this issue to find a solution. The first step will be an open beta starting today for uh, for Fortnite that will allow for cross-platform uh, gameplay, progression, and commerce across PlayStation 4, Android, iOS, Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, Microsoft Windows, and Mac operating systems. We see the beta as an opportunity to conduct thorough testing that ensures cross-platform play is best on PlayStation, while being mindful about the user experience from both a technical and social perspective. For 24 years, we have strived to deliver the best gaming experience to our fans, 
uh, by providing a uniquely PlayStation perspective. Today, the communities around some games have evolved to the point where cross-platform experiences add significant value to players. In recognition of this, we have uh, completed a thorough analysis of the business mechanics required to ensure that the PlayStation experience for our users remains intact today and in the future as we look to open up the platform. This represents a majority policy change for SIE, and we are now in the uh, planning process across the organization to support this change. We will update the community once we have more details to share, including more specifics regarding the beta time frame and what this means for other titles going forward. That is a really fancy way to say we flipped the switch. Yeah. Yep. Uh, very, very packaged kind of response. Um, and I think it acknowledges a lot of their past comments in a pretty tactful way. <laughs> I think it's a very like, okay, so we were right to be hesitant, but now we see that like, it's okay. So we were still like the good guys here. We're just looking out for you. Right. Yeah. Like it was very much a, we've gone back on our position, but you know, he like, here's the totally legitimate reason why it's taken us this long to say anything, <laughs> which whatever they got there. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I agree. I think that a lot of the conversation surrounding this was a little bit hyperbolic, but I also think that uh, for them to have held out for this long, considering where we are with gaming is a little crazy. But more than anything, I actually think this speaks to the power of Fortnite. Because I yeah. think if this is Call of Duty or anything else, they're not even talking about this. No. Because it's Fortnite, um, they had to move. Dude, they yeah, had... you look at how they treated Rocket League, and they were like, nah, you can play with PC, it's fine. And you're totally right. It's that Fortnite is the biggest fucking game in the world right now. Because yep. it could run for president and probably win. So Yeah. yeah. Like, I'd vote for Fortnite. Fortnite is one of those games like like you see in the headlines in the mainstream news where there was like the FIFA player that did the victory dance and all that kind of shit but it's like Fortnite is one of those games where like your grandmother could know what it is you know like it has that like that Minecraft Mario Brothers Pokemon level crossover appeal where like every fucking child in the world is playing Fortnite right now for the most part you know um and yes I don't I was right. just gonna say I, I don't know a kid who doesn't play Fortnite. Right, and Sony would be stupid to leave that money on the table. And like we've said in previous episodes, uh, my whole thing is that any money, even if they would make more money having a gated off, like a walled off community, it's not worth the bad PR. You're already winning so fucking hard. Like take the dip in Fortnite money and just save yourself the bad publicity. Because, like, Sony came off like, you know, the asshole in that situation. They were screwing consumers out of money money they had spent on other platforms by linking their stuff and, and not letting the cross-progression go. And they were looking like, oh, look at Microsoft and Nintendo who are teaming up and making commercials together. And Sony's the one left out in the cold. You know? And, and it was a very just, like, anti-Sony narrative there. And now, like, people will forget. They'll move on. They'll forget it was ever not a thing. And by the next console generation, this won't be a thing that people can ding them for, which is what they had to be worried about, I think, is that when the PS5 yep. rolls around, you don't want Xbox being the one of like, look at all these pro-consumer moves we made for you during the Xbox One era. You know you want to go with the Xbox Two. I have to think that it has a little to do with Nintendo's little jabs here and there. Have Having them teamed up with Xbox a little bit, you know, like uh to to have that kind of like PR like on their side for a while, I think probably helped a lot more than just because like the people can speak what they want, but Sony wasn't going to budge, you know, and I think like when the PR was starting to like they were like oh shit, they're getting digs in on us, like everyone's starting to get digs now, like oh fuck, you know. It's really piling up. I don't think they expected it to get to that level ever, you know, even though like yeah. because they just underestimated like how many fucking people play this game. And how yeah. and how it's it's not like it's John it's, it's just not a game it's it's a cultural thing yeah All the kids it's a, it's like a too. moment it's a moment right. in our in so, our culture right now yeah and you can't have I don't know how many millions of people they have uh, on their install base and then tell them you know like which is the biggest one for the console so it's like you can't have the biggest amount of people have access to a thing and say why the hell can't we play the biggest game ever on the biggest install base that doesn't make sense with everyone else you know that's mm -hmm. that's crazy when everyone mm -hmm. else can do that with everything else it's weird to have that in that in that culture for that game the way it was already set up it was weird to just have that like 
section just be there. It's crazy mm. to me that like not even Minecraft could make this happen. Yeah, well, this is the next Minecraft, but now more people even play games, and this is even more accessible and and free, so and you know, and it's just insane. You know, it's insane how big it is. Yeah, yeah, man, and uh, it's it's a titan. And um, I think I, I'm just I'm glad to see Sony get their house in order on this subject because this was this was one of those things that reeked of old Sony to me of like yeah, PS3 yeah. cocky era yep. Sony and like I don't want to see that Sony come back I want to see was, the hungry little... PS4 pro consumer we're all about games Sony that's the Sony that you know has given us the current slate of games they've got right now and and delivered us like a great great console so. Um, I, I want to see, I want to see them, you know, not, uh, get too cocky and, and throw away the fucking crown by accident. Um, but moving right along, uh, in, in Sony news, uh, Sean Layden has confirmed, which is the, uh, worldwide PlayStation's worldwide studios chairman has, uh, confirmed that PSX will not be happening in 2018. Layden made the, uh, the statement on the PlayStation blogcast, and, uh, I've got, this is an article from Jonathan Dornbush over at IGN. He pulled the quotes for me, so, uh, go, go give him the click. Um, but, so here's, here's what Sean had to say about, about the situation. For 2018, I know this is going to be a disappointment to some people, but we decided not to hold PlayStation Experience this year. We won't have it in the States this year. The reasons behind that, we don't, uh, the reasons behind that really are we don't have we okay sorry so this is a little awkward because like i'm reading someone's stream of consciousness and it's all over the place so forgive me but this is what it says the reasons behind that really are we don't have we have a lot of progress that we're making on our games now that we have spider-man out the door we're looking down into 2019 games like dreams and days gone but we wouldn't have enough to bring people all together in some location north america in north america to have that event we don't want to set expectations really high and then not deliver on that. It was a hard decision, but we have determined that this year we will not hold PlayStation Experience. And then uh, he said that he kind of attributed it to their increased usage of the PlayStation blog and like social media platforms to announce things throughout the year instead of using like a conference. Uh, and then he said, part of our commitment to that going forward is we're going to amp that up. We're going to crank those communications up and we're, we're going to find more ways to get our message out and to get a view into what our activities are and what our hopes and dreams are, if you will, for PlayStation and for worldwide studios. Uh, so, and then I think Dornbush here also points out that like, there was a lot of controversy around PSX last year that they, they had kind of opted not to do the traditional press conference. A lot of people were kind of disappointed in what they had to offer, so I think it kind of makes sense that they took a year off here to, to to readjust. But what do you guys think about this? Do you think this is the end for PSX, or do you think do you think we'll see a return in the future? I think we'll see a return in the future, uh, but probably not while the the PS4 is in its. I, I, it's not yeah. old age, but like the PS4 is, uh, you know, it's it's. I think it's past the halfway point. I don't yeah. think we'll see another one until the PS5 because it's. Like, Sony's sort of on the way out in terms of what they have left for, like, this new generation of games. Yeah, like, like their their current software slate ends at 2020. Yep, yeah, you got Dreams, you got Days Gone, you've got Last of Us 2, you've got Death Stranding. I don't think that's enough to justify a, like, a whole conference especially when they showed us all that stuff at e3 this year like how much more yep. do they have to show us that would be yeah. that substantial you know right we, had, I think we had, go ahead oh no i was gonna say i just think it's, it's a good idea just uh, i'm with andy you know um every year we're gonna see psx with more death stranding crap that i just just stop you know <laughs> like so if that's all they had every year was like here's another video of it whatever you know they yep, should yep, get yep. psx but only show Death Stranding. <laughs> Look, if they have like DSX, if they have like a three-hour <laughs> intro reveal segment, because I'm sure there's like an hour and a half of cutscenes because it's a Gojima game just to start the game. But if they had that at a as like an event, kind of like a Nintendo Direct, like PSX, that's it, just Death Stranding, I'd be in. Because then I'd have an idea maybe what the game is. No, you wouldn't. Possibly. <laughs> I but, don't know. I I would love to see them. Like, I, I loved when they did the press conference. Like, you know, you, you guys know I'm, like, a Sony pony, but uh, – and they don't do a lot of stuff like that. But 
I I think it would be cool if they just doubled down on making it like a more pack style event like they tried to do last year and just make sure there's value in it. Like have it be like even if there is a press conference with like mild announcements and stuff like that, cool. But like have it be more focused on, oh, this is like a place for you to go and like we're gonna have like devs come and do talks and you can go play demos of the new games and you can go to the store and buy PlayStation swag and go to panels and you know, like that sort of thing. Like have it be a more community oriented event that's like more focused around playing the games than making announcements. I yep. think like I think that would be you know, I think that could be really successful. Absolutely. I also wanna um just suggest that if they do this they also do like the big silly physical events we sometimes see there so like uh, we've created a hundred yard recreation of this one level from crash that you can run through yeah like do stuff like that you know yeah yeah like they can make a a tomb raider uh, rock climbing course or or something you know look at that (laughs) but uh you you can go there and enjoy it sean you were trying to weigh in on this before Yeah, I was just going to say that we had talked about how many games they had uh, to come out this year and last year and next year, but the games that have already come out are out, and the games that are coming out, we kind of know enough about to be ready for them. And I I think this is a smart move, and, you know, I think he was honest, and and he kind of... He kind of caught himself because at the very beginning he was gonna he was gonna say we don't have anything to show, yeah. And then he caught himself <laughs> and you know promo the games that they do have coming out a little bit, and then soft more softly said you know we, we don't really have enough to make it valuable for you, and I think that's fine. You know if you don't have if you don't have anything to say, don't say it. You know that's perfect. Agreed. Uh, so it's um. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think this is a, a definitely a smart move. It's it's disappointing because as a Sony fan, like I always find PSX to be exciting because that would be where they would focus on smaller stuff. But I think I think with where we're at right now, it's it, it probably makes sense to just not do it this year and and you know maybe come back stronger in in twenty twenty or twenty nineteen. But uh, one thing that I did think was really funny that I saw a lot of people making the rounds was I, I think I brought this up last year when we talked about PSX was. Uh, um, my boy Greg Miller from from Kind of Funny is uh, obviously a big Sony guy and like often has a, has a presence at PSX and he interviewed Sean Layden uh, at for like their keynote and the first thing the first question he asked him was when are we going to be able to change our PlayStation names and he said by next year at PSX I, I'm pretty sure we'll have an announcement for you. <laughs> And it's like, ha- and oh. I saw, I saw this. You know that meme of the uh, the I dude where it's like, oh, like promise to do this thing. Like they can't be mad at you. And the the, the guy's like pointing at his yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Of like it's yeah. that meme. And it was like they can't be mad at you for not delivering at PSX if you don't hold PSX. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, please Sony, let me change my fucking name, and I'll be happy. It'll be fine that we don't get PSX this year. So. Uh, You're just going to well, be quiet, Pete, from now on, right? Yeah, well, if they let me do that, yeah, I'll be over it. <laughs> I'll have this nothing to complain change. about. <laughs> Someone's going to look and see, like, wow, he went from loud to quiet. What happened in this man's life? Look the paradigm this. has changed. Uh, so, uh, but in uh, Sony's place, Microsoft has uh, jumped into the fray to announce that they've got a uh, a big old Xbox event planned called X X18? I guess it's X018. It's like 2018. Get it? I don't yeah. know. Anyway. <laughs> so uh, during um, Inside Xbox, they uh, they made an announcement for the event uh, that's called a global celebration of all things Xbox. And it's supposed to take place in Mexico City, of all places. Uh, that's no- really cool. Right? Uh, on November 10th and 11th. So uh, they haven't really given any, like, details about it, but they said it would be, quote, the largest live Inside Xbox event ever, which doesn't mean that much because Inside Xbox is pretty new, and I don't know that they've done many live events, but that's okay. Uh, It's going to be broadcast online. There's going to be news, first looks, surprises, whatever, all that kind of stuff. You get it. It seems like it's a PSX kind of event that you can go to if your press are important or, you know, there's fans you can get, you know, but it doesn't seem like it's, you know, going to be a huge event, but it will be live streamed on Mixer, which is Microsoft's uh, streaming platform, won't be on Twitch. Uh, and there's going to be um, an episode of Inside Xbox that takes place during that event uh, that will be airing 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern time. 
uh, and then we'll be going until uh, 6 Eastern time or 3 p.m. Pacific. So it's a two-hour event, press conference kind of deal where they're going to be, you know, I guess debuting all this new information. So uh, we'll link down below. You can check out more information about it on Microsoft's official website, but there's really not that much. Um, but I think you're able to, like, go and sign up, like, you know, if you want to get alerted for tickets and all that kind of stuff. So uh, if this seems like something that you want to check out, uh, get get prepared for it. Um, I thought in general this is a pretty cool announcement just because uh, I think Xbox has been doing a really good job of kind of cultivating its community and speaking to the audience that's loyal to them. And uh, I'm interested to see how this event does for them. Absolutely. Um, I think the same way it made sense for PlayStation not to have PSX, I think this makes sense for Xbox. Especially when there's a void this year. Yep. It's like, why not take the weekend? you know dominate that conversation for a little bit and we know they have stuff cooking they bought all these new studios they haven't released a new ip or new game from many of their studios in a while we know what some of them are working on but we also don't know what some of them are working on so i don't know it's gonna be interesting i'm I'm interested to see what they have up their sleeve and uh i hope i hope they show up in a big way i hope they impress us yeah i just want them to show more ori so that's that's really all i want out of this event probably realistic All right, so <laughs> just all right, just okay. Let it hang. <laughs> uh, so moving right along, this one's for uh, Thompson, uh, Castlevania Requiem, Symphony of the Night, and Rondo of Blood is coming to uh, PS4 exclusively on October 26, which is the same day that the Netflix show comes back. Mm-hmm. Netflix mm-hmm. is back in full. Or uh, Netflix Castlevania is back in full force, baby. Sean, why yeah, are you laughing? rondo of blood like <laughs> what does that mean i don't understand that it's, that's just like a rondo is a type of shield or, where you play as rajon rondo <laughs> oh man so thompson here have your bask have your your your, your 15 seconds here what's up you excited for this yeah i'm gonna play symphony Night again for like the 10,000th time you know um uh, I, I've just I can't not play it, and obviously the show coming back is huge. Um, you know that that show is fucking great, so watch it, and it's sooner than I thought. So yeah, I really you play excited. Rondo of Blood. Uh, probably not because like <laughs> you're not gonna I play Rondo of Blood. One. You've never played it. You gotta try it, Thompson. It's Rondo of Blood. It's an undeniable <laughs> classic. Yeah, Rondo's on the Lakers now. He's playing with LeBron. It's going to be great. Come on. I'm pretty sure it, would, it really means like Shield of Blood because a Rondo is a type of shield. So I'm just oh, saying. Like, you know. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't <laughs> played that one yet. <laughs> Symphony of Night, it, doesn't, it can be packaged with anything. It's like when people buy a Final <laughs> Fantasy collection of 10 games and they're like, yeah, but I'm only buying it for, you know, this one. It, that's symphony of night for me you know it showed anywhere anytime we gotta try it man i mean sure but like i love symphony of night so i'm playing that you know what i'm okay. saying i'm just saying what if you also <laughs> maybe love i'll try the other one but i don't have a lot of time to just try new castlevanias when there's one i i know and love like Dude, an addiction, almost i need your impressions <laughs> <laughs> we're playing it don't get we're doing it i'm excited because i feel like this is perfect timing uh with with it coming out on october 26th we can have like a nice little uh <clears throat> week of castlevania on the video game pals channel if we want that's interesting so maybe we'll do that um i know we wanted to do a review of netflix of the season two of the netflix show and we could do uh some uh, symphony of the night and rondo of blood let's plays so <laughs> Get hyped for that shit. <laughs> um, I, think, I think you have to save the Rondo of Blood Let's Plays for when Sean's there. Yes, actually. That sounds brilliant. And you can call the video series <laughs> Rondo of Blood. Yes! Oh my god! <laughs> this is fucking oh brilliant. Oh my god. I. Oh, that's funny. It's I happening. We're, ha- we're doing this. Wow. It's on the calendar. So... <laughs> uh, so obviously, this is really this is a hype couple of announcements if you're a Castlevania fan, and uh, it got me thinking of a little random question of the week. Oh, oh no! All right, for all you motherfuckers. Whoa! You like that? I'm coming in hot fire, baby. Okay. <laughs> so, 
my random question for you guys is I, I wanted to ask, do you think this could mean uh, a new Castlevania is in the works? Do you think we could be uh, heading towards the Castlevania Renaissance? And if we are, what shape would you like to see that take? We have Castlevanias in Smash with a ton of music, two characters, their own stage. We've got this new collection. We got season two of the very successful Netflix show coming back. It seems like Castlevania is poised for a comeback here. Um, and I'm, I'm interested to see how you, what you guys would like to see. How would you want Castlevania to come back if it were to return? I want it to come back good. I want them to come back <laughs> with Hot a takes. Rondo of Blood HD remake. I... <laughs> I want Symphony of the Night on every platform. No, no, Rondo of Blood. Listen, I have literally no connection to Castlevania whatsoever. So I actually don't care how it comes back at all. And I don't care if it does, except for, you know, my people who love Castlevania. That's great for you. And so, therefore, I hope it's good. But as far as format, I, I don't know because I don't I don't play those games. I want Rondo of Blood. <laughs> that's it. That's all, that's all I know. Me too. Uh, right, Andy, what about you? Okay, so I want it to be good, like Sean said. Um, but also, I'm not sure if it's really coming back. I like, I don't trust Konami. I I think they're capitalizing well on what's there, but I also think that the company doesn't care about like making quality video games if they can cash in on an IP. Uh, I would personally, if yeah. it's coming back. And it's getting like a, a like an update. I would love to see it in the Resident Evil uh, Seven style, just like oh, really th throw parts of the formula out the window and like get it down to its core and change the dressing and see what happens. I think that would be really cool. Really lean into the horror elements of it, you know? Yeah, and there's never really been a successful Castlevania that's done that, like. There was, like, I think one 3D one that was, like, kind of okay, but I feel like most of them have been really poorly received. Yeah, the PS2 one was 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 pretty good, you know? It was, yeah. wasn't the Nintendo 64 one. That was... Sure. <laughs> oh, boy. So what about but you, Thompson? No, you know. Or uh, no, I'll, I... I'll go. You could go last because you're the, you're the Castlevania expert. Um, so for me, I would like to just see them start small. Like, I would rather them just be like, let's just make a new Castle... Excuse me, a new Castlevania game with like a stripped down style you know like let's go you know pixel graphics uh like you know classic gameplay and like don't try to reinvent the wheel just like what sean said like just make a good one like get a good like you know it doesn't like not like a, a reboot but like a soft reboot of like a here's an easy thing for you to pick up if you know the legacy of castlevania but you don't have any like relationship to it you can pick it up you can play it you can understand it and you can you know like the metroidvania is in right now like that's a thing and the fact that they're not putting out a solid annualized castlevania or every three years a good castlevania game like they did on the ds is a shame uh because there's an audience for it and all they need to do is put you know, they already scared off Iga, but get a Castlevania fan like Thompson, who's a game designer, uh, or get the people behind one of the popular Metroidvanias that are around right now that grew up on those games and let them take that IP and do something fresh with it, like uh, like Sega did with Sonic Mania, right? Like, let a fan make a fan game that's actually good and, like, and just put the real seal on there and let it go. So, Thompson, as the Castlevania expert, what, what, what's your take here? I don't think it's coming back anytime soon, but I do like the fact that we've gotten like the show because like interest in it is up at least, so that's cool. But I, I I totally agree. Like Konami doesn't care, um, you know, unless somebody came to them and could like show like this will make money if I make this game. You know, here's my idea, and it's gonna make you buckets of money. That that then they'll make something. But unless that happens, they're they're not in it for you know. For the fans of that stuff too you know like it, it, it's just it's like you said they're capitalizing you know um it would be really hard too to i think make a good one in the same vein as like that would match up with the old ones because it would just feel like oh it's just recreating the old ones but i don't really think i would want that you know what i mean mm -hmm. i want to play something because i love that game i don't want to play the same game but on a new system you know that's not the same game because there's going to be stuff that i'm going to immediately compare it to so diving into the horror elements of it 
really sounds interesting. That got me thinking. Like, you you play this game and you will you will die. I'm not saying like Dark Souls or whatever, but like it's not like that. You know, you're not like the tagline saying you die, you'll die. But um, <laughs> it was interesting. Like games like Dead Cells and stuff. You know, play around the concept of like you know roguelikes and all that. Um, this Metroidvania series never really had a game where they were like fully embracing the horror elements. Um, if you could, if you slow down the combat more and had it more like methodical and you know about blocking and stuff more so like the, the sword play and all that. Whips yeah, and, and like really focusing on like using the items and stuff like that. Yeah, right. More like the Souls games in that respect. I'm not saying like the difficulty spike, but if you had the combat changed like that and made it more horror elements, like slower moving oh, enemies dude. would seem scarier finally like you know giant yeah. mummies and shit you know would be terrifying to you and you know when when you're like fuck i i can't like you know they have a guard level and all that i, I don't know like it might be interesting to see like how that plays out into these games because it would still be like a metroidvania but you know having it have like in-game skills that are you know actually affecting the combat like that dude um, it would be really would be cool really to fun. see them like take the original castlevania and remake it like that like just tell the original story and like same weapons and everything, but realize it in like a third person like action kind of space. Like imagine like a Dark Souls Legend of Zelda style like combat with a whip. How fucking yeah, like, cool would that yeah, be? Yeah, like definitely like Zelda, like especially the new one, you know? Um something like that. Like that camera perspective would work perfect for like a smaller, you know, like that's like the PS2 one's kinda like that, you know? Yeah. But if we really dived into the like the the scary shit of this series, like Resident Evil style, you know, like or like, you know, y- you know, Parasite Eve kind of crap, you know, like you can put some really gnarly shit from the Castlevania verse and actually like bloodborne it the hell out of it, you know, and make it look <laughs> disgusting and terrifying like it should be. Because you kind of go through these things and yeah, you're the hunter or, or whatever, you're the protagonist, but it, it it doesn't like speak the volume of just terrible terrible shit that like the netflix show had given in like just one episode alone where they show like babies being like snatched out of cribs and like by demons and you're just like that's fucked up like they talk about how bad this is but you just go in there and stomp house they never show how terrible what's actually happening is going on so you know props to the show for like you know even exploring that aspect of it so cool yeah, man, I think uh, I, I think that would be a really cool idea. And um, I hope for your sake that Castlevania is getting its comeback, and I hope it's good. I hope it's not a Metal Gear Survive level comeback. Um, so. <laughs> One that only Thompson puts 100 hours into and hates every hour of. <laughs> I had a few good hours. <laughs> uh, all right, so moving right along, uh, this last story is going to – tangentially take us into our main topic it's a very flimsy excuse to thread them together but comic books so uh let's do it it's not a podcast for that we're here to talk about video games but it's video games about superheroes so it's a gray area so yeah. so i'm off the show now all right get out of here Sorry, Me and Sean talk about it. <laughs> oh, about shit, Sean covered his camera up i'm alone all right so <laughs> no, I, no i'm here i'm here hold on let me get phil and kale on the phone oh, don't do that no please don't i'll take marco over those two chuckleheads uh, so, uh, this one's from Shabana Arif over at IGN, and, uh, this is an article about, mm, coming, some news from, uh, Marvel Games and their feelings about, about how Spider-Man's been performing. So, Bill Roseman, Marvel Games Executive Director of Spider-Man, tweeted that the success of the PS4 exclusive, quote, kicks off a new era for Marvel console games. Uh, referencing a GameSpot video that features a Kinda Funny Games interview with the Insomniac Creative Director. Shout out to Kinda Funny. Uh, Brian Intahar, Roseman tweeted, One of my fave parts of this video is when Brian talks about how Marvel Spider-Man is intended to be, quote, the Iron Man of Marvel video games, which is exactly how we view it. As with that first MCU hit, Marvel's Spider-Man kicks off a new era for Marvel console games. Uh, so I... That that was just kind of I wanted to use as like a bit of a, a jumping off point. I think that's a really exciting comment uh, because I mean, regardless of your feelings about um, about the MCU, uh, like I, I think Marvel Spider Man is like undeni- of undeniable quality. And if they're if what they're saying in this statement is that this is our first effort here and we intend to continue growing it out and building out Marvel's games portfolio in the same way we built out our film portfolio. That's deeply exciting to me. 
Yeah, uh, I agree. <clears throat> I think on its face, that's an incredible statement. Um, and I think that there's probably no shortage of developers that they could partner with to do this. But I have some concerns. Hit me with them. So, so it's not the same thing as Marvel having a film studio and making movies because that's all done in house. Uh, they choose the director, they choose you know who they bring in, um, and they make a movie that's a collaborative effort between them and what Kevin Feige and his people want, right? And they all have the same look, the same general feel. It's you know it's samey. It's the Marvel style. We accept it. We love it. Games don't work like that. If you bring in a different developer, you're going to get a very different style. I don't yeah. think that you can necessarily just replicate what Spider-Man is if you shift to another developer no. who has their own style. On top of that, you can't have just Insomniac making these games because they take years to make. I'm assuming they would like to see Marvel games of AAA quality coming out relatively often. Like, And they're already making partnerships with other people. They are, right, exactly. So if the games aren't all Spider-Man level, right, then what happens? Yeah. Uh, and then also, Doctor Strange, as an example, is a character who we understand in the film world. And you can make a movie that's just very like similar to Iron Man, um, and it works for reasons that are similar to Iron Man, but it doesn't challenge you on a deep level in that sense. A Doctor Strange game, though, looks so different from a Spider-Man game that I don't even know if anyone's thought about what that looks like, right? That's total. That's something, that's a whole other world. And so how do you translate those characters whose powers work on screen in one way, but in a video game would have to be done very, very differently. Yeah. You can't just, you can't just take the same concept from Spider-Man and then, you know, apply it to every character. That won't work. Yeah, you're totally right. And I think uh, something that else is really interesting about this is like even just like using Iron Man as an example, right? Like Iron Man's one of their most mainstream characters right now. You want an Iron Man game. Iron Man doesn't work as well on a, as a video game as Spider-Man does, I don't think. No. Like flying is not as fun as web swinging, period. Like there's a gamification to Spider-Man's powers uh, that is unique to him. And with characters like, you know, Iron Man or even somebody like the Hulk, you know, where, like, their um, method of movement is flying or just, like, blindly leaping. I, I Making that fun on its face, I think, is going to be more challenging than, than it is for Spider-Man. You know, he, he lends himself to video games in a way that few other characters do quite as well because he has limitations, you know? So, I, I agree with everything you're saying. But I think that the the MCU can be sort of a template for um, how a like a Marvel video game stable would work because, like Sean said, everything is kind of samey. But they've also allowed themselves room to sort of experiment within that sameness, mm -hmm. like Ant Man, like Guardians of the Galaxy, like uh, Captain America: Winter Soldier. Those are all like definitely still Marvel movies, but they're the Marvel movie take on other genres. Yeah. And so if you wanted to like to do the, the Sony in-house studios thing, right? You got this great open world Spider-Man game. You're swinging around. I think you could do a pretty fun uncharted style Iron Man game. Like it's not, it's not open world. So you're not just like flying around New York or whatever. You're, you know, zipping through set piece to set piece of like, big exploding iron man you know jumps and floats around a lot blasts a bunch of people yeah i think that could be a lot of fun and i think that would work for a lot of their characters like captain america would work for something like that really I mean, well dude speaking of iron man you don't have to just play uh the parts of just iron man like you you could be running the avengers from the mcu and delegating like there's a whole level of gameplay element that isn't just playing the superhero that the spider-man game was just showing like the little bit I played, it's like, oh, build your suit or whatever. Fine. If you're if you set Iron Man up like to to have like you know, like teammates and stuff too. Like there's there's obviously like stuff you could do there. You could even make multiplayer games out of these games. You know, like that. There's just so many 
avenues that these characters could be gamified better with than just being single player like story driven things that they don't have to be that necessarily you know right yeah they don't all have to take that form by any means and i think like the fact that they've already done like a mobile game though like they they are doing other stuff and i think we will see that but that speaks to sean's point of like then is that cohesion there yeah i mean that's the problem it's it's the cohesion is kind of like based on marvel's you know partnerships where they say like this is what we want and how much say they actually have over these studios making the games there was a there was a period of time where you could have a game like for example ultimate alliance there was also the deadpool game i mean there these games weren't good but they had the um the iron man game and i think there was also a captain america game yeah there were were spider-man games yeah Yeah. the sega games that were really i actually own iron man it was a really bad birthday gift um (laughs) it's yeah it's it's bad um but at that time, you could have all those games. There was no need for them to make sense together. No one was asking that question. What Bill is saying is that these games, and, and maybe I'm misinterpreting him, it sounds to me like what he's saying is that they are going to be interlocking. They're supposed to mm-hmm. make sense together. And that isn't the same thing as having like a mobile game and also having, you know, yeah. ultimate alliance or whatever like now you're saying there has to be a cohesion and i'm saying that there's a difference between because you can't make a game where iron man is just fighting thugs that, that that's not going to work you can't have a game where the hulk is just you know fighting joe schmo thug yeah just street. doing the kind of shit that you do in spider-man like, right you right you, you have to they have to think outside of the box and i think those games are going to be games unlike what we have seen from other games. Because I can't think of a game that stars a character like the Hulk. Rampage, but that's weird for the Hulk, because the Hulk is a hero. You can't have him destroying, you know, buildings and causing massive chaos. Well, I mean... I don't know. You, you kind of... I mean, I don't know. It, it depends, right? Like, it depends on what Marvel wants to do with the character at this point in the game. But there was a great Hulk game back on the uh, GameCube, Xbox, PlayStation 2 that's actually, like, a really good superhero video game. One of the few... I, I, you, you're not along, Sean. It looks like you remember the one I'm talking about. I do, yes. And that was like very much a you're destroying cities sometimes. Your military is chasing you. Right. You're taking down helicopters and all that kind of shit. I think you could totally make a game like that and and have it be good. And and like you said, the but it. I think the thing that's interesting though is like the point you made earlier about the development studios is that even if they're all making third person action games. Uh, Insomniac's games don't feel like uh, Crystal Dynamics games. Who is the other studio that they're working with on Avengers right now? Right. You know? And how is that cohesion going to work? How is it going to make sense? And is it even going to? Is that even what he meant? I don't know. Because it could just mean that he means this is the this is the Iron Man of the Marvel game stuff because this is the first stepping stone towards uh, a greater relevance of Marvel in video games. That yeah, could it just mean like a seal of approval. Like, you know, these are quality games, like the like, same way, you know, he means... Yeah. I, I took it that way originally. Yeah. I didn't even consider the other one at first until you mentioned it, but I just thought he meant like, oh, these these games are going to be good, like Spider-Man I think, is I good. think they both make sense. Like, I think yeah. what Sean's saying is it, it could mean that. It could also just mean that they're saying you're going to come to trust the Marvel games brand in the same way you trust Marvel Studios. You know? Cool. I'm wait. I am anxiously waiting to see them do that, because I I strongly feel like a Thor video game is hard to do. I oh, think yeah. I like I I think that they're gonna have to find developers who can think outside the box to make these games make sense for these characters. Because Pete, you're right. That Hulk game was good. Does Marvel want to represent the Hulk that way in 2018? when the film character doesn't do those things. Right. He doesn't and kill civilians. He, he, they're not going to do that. I, or right. at least I don't think they will. Maybe I'm wrong. We'll see. But I'm, 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 I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful. Yeah, and I think that's the takeaway, is that there are clear and present challenges here to, to delivering on what he's promising. But that doesn't mean I'm not confident that they'll do it. It's just interesting to see how it's going to play out. Because right. I think looking at how good Spider-Man came out gives me a lot of confidence. And the fact that they're not trying to do it in-house, I think, is actually a good thing. I think that would have been the wrong move. I think the fact that they're already partnering with people who are like, you're the top-tier talent, you know how to make video games, take this IP that people give a shit about and make it make sense. 
That, to me, is the best strategy here. And I think that's why they're going to find success is because they're partnering with some of the best in the world right now, and that's that's a good start. My last yep. point is that of I think of every single character that Marvel has, Spider-Man is absolutely the, the very easiest to make a video game for. I agree. So we'll um, see. And also you got to think they had, what, uh, 20 years of blueprints of what <laughs> yeah. works and what doesn't, you know, to think about. And they got it better than any of these other people for sure, but they did have something to look at previously where a lot of these characters haven't ever been realized in a video game. So there are definitely challenges to overcome there. Uh, but I... Here's I an idea. There's room. We do Fantastic Four, but like Left for Dead. And you have to escape that would alien, be fucking... alien worlds and shit. Yeah, and the end just... of the level is like teleporting through like the negative zone or some shit. You're just like fucking fighting scrolls or something. Yeah, that could right? be really cool. Yeah, I actually, I actually think that's incredible. That would be an awesome <laughs> that would idea. Be incredible. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So Ooh. I, I, I oh, think. Man. Right. I, I think the real takeaway here is that it's awesome to see Marvel opening up their IP this way. And I can't wait to see who they partner with next. Because I, based on Spider-Man and based on Crystal Dynamics' track record, I think it seems obvious that uh, that the Avengers game will probably be good. And, you know, I, I also love this move because I think it's a great opportunity for developers who are fucking insanely talented to make games that are going to be bestsellers instead of IP that people might overlook. Like, Insomniac is one of the best in the biz. Not everybody cares about Ratchet and Clank. Nobody cared about Sunset Overdrive. Everyone cares about Spider-Man. And now they might care about their next big thing. I don't and, know that I've bought a, an Insomniac game other than Spider-Man this console cycle. I don't I don't think I have. Probably not. For what it's worth, Sunset Overdrive is really fucking good. Right, and that's the thing. It's, it's not a dig at the quality of those games. It's just it's the same thing with Crystal and Tomb Raider. Like, Tomb Raider has never, like, it's not a blockbuster in the way that it, like, and it's a big game, and it's successful, and they're great, but it's not, it's not one of the best-selling game of the year. Same right, with Arcane it's not the Day. Avengers. It's it's not that, even, even Tomb Raider doesn't have the IP resonance of the Avengers. And that's awesome for Crystal. That's awesome because their next game will get way more attention in the same way that everybody's like, what the fuck is Rocksteady doing next? Even if they don't do the Justice League game that we're going to talk about next, uh, people care. And getting to work with IPs like Spider-Man, like the Avengers, like Iron Man, like the Hulk, that matters. And not only do these, a lot of these characters, I think, you know, superheroes are a no-brainer for, for video games. They just are often not gotten right. And putting it in the hands of the best of the best is how you get it right. Because yeah. I don't know how you make an Iron Man game fun. But do you know who I really think can figure it out? Crystal Dynamics. You know? Uh, so, um, I'm excited for this development. I'm excited about this quote. I hope that the path forward for Marvel games is as bright as, uh, as Spider-Man seems to be for a starting point. All right, so our last news story here is going to be the kind of jumping off point for our meat and potatoes. As I teased a bit earlier, uh, there is a new rumor that suggests that Rock City Studios might be working on a game about the Justice League uh, instead of the Superman game that's been heavily rumored. Um, this is not a new rumor, but this specific iteration of it uh, originates on 4chan, so you might want to take it with a grain of salt. But uh, I, I, I think it's a fun conversation to have anyway, and there's been so much talk about the idea of Rocksteady making a Superman game or a Justice League game or uh, something else set in the DC universe that I finally wanted to take the opportunity to address it and have a little fun with the topic. So I've linked to the story down below uh, if you want to check out you know the, the, the leak itself, but essentially... Um, the, the rumor is that Rock City is working on this Justice League game. It could be called Justice League Crisis, New Crisis, Infinite Crisis, all this stuff. Uh, and that the game is supposedly going to be announced in 2019. Uh, they said that it would have a single player and a co-op mode with the ability to switch between characters like you could in Arkham Knight. And um, that the characters available would be Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern, Cyborg, and Aquaman. And that uh, locations would include Metropolis, Gotham, Keystone... And uh, that it would take place pretty early in each of their careers. And that Starro, who is the original Justice League uh, villain, would be the game's main villain. Uh, they also said that there would be DLC that would add new content similar to Hitman. Where there would be 
uh, adding vi- new villains to the game, like Darkseid or Brainiac with new cities and more heroes that you could add to your roster and stuff. So I, the, the more you hear about this, the more it sounds like fan fiction. But uh, either way, there's been a rumor, like I said, cooking, that ever since uh, the Dark Knight, um, or Arkham Knight, I guess I should say, the, the final of their Arkham trilogy, that uh, that they're working on the next big DC property. So I wanted to just kind of open the floor here. Uh, we can assume that these things are true. We can assume they're fake. What would you want to see out of Roxetti's next, you know, DC game and and I, I'd like to keep it specifically on the Justice League but if you've got this excellent pitch for their Superman game or a Batman Beyond title or something that you want to throw out here I'm willing to open up the you know the walls a little bit here and and talk it through so what, I want to see it get announced <laughs> Sean uh, you had a lot of responses to what I was reading there so so hit me with your what do you got what are your takes well, on this just just on the on the concept alone that is insanely stupid that Starro <laughs> would be the villain of the game. You can tell that a fan wrote this because you're not going to have Starro be the main villain and then Darkseid be the DLC villain. Yeah, no um, fucking What way. planet are you from? Yeah, That's insane. Like making Steppenwolf the villain in your movie. I completely agree with you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to argue with that. Uh, so that's on its face ridiculous. But what came before that I thought was an interesting premise. I think that there is... A world in which a video game where you can play as the different members of the Justice League um, at once. Well, not at once, but swapping between them yeah, could be very cool. But I think that that would be so, so hard to do well. Um, But if you could imagine, like, if all the Justice League members are in Metropolis and they have to you know, I don't know, defuse a bomb while there's an alien invasion going on. You could see the Flash having to do one part of the mission while Batman has to go gather information, while Wonder Woman's fighting Steppenwolf. While, you know, like, there's there's a lot of stuff that could happen, and if they captured that hectic feel, I think that could be cool. The problem is that for something to cause the Justice League to have to come together, I don't know how you get... Like, how long is Spider-Man? Like, 40 hours? Not 40 hours. How long is Spider-Man? 20 hours if you play through just the main campaign and do, like, minimal side quests. Right. I don't know how you get 20 hours out of an experience where the point of the game is that you swap between them. I think if, if it was, like, a game where each character has their own sort of thing that's going on, and then sometimes there's team ups, and then at the end, there's that big, oh, now you play as all seven for the finale, that could be kind of cool. But what's the upgrade system like? You know, like there's there's a lot of questions there. Yeah. But if you're, but but to answer the question of what I would like to see, um, I I think that the future of DC games is in Superman. I really do. Or I mean, no, no, sticking with that, Superman. I think I think they need to get a Superman game right. And a Flash game, right, before you even try making a game where you just play as everybody at once. I agree. I, I totally I mean, agree with Sean, that. what do you mean get a Superman game right? You're acting like we don't have Superman 64. As the You're right. Here. Sorry. I forgot all about it. You inhuman fucking monster. <laughs> no, the uh, inhumans are Marvel characters, Pete. Oh, uh, should get you on the comics, pals, instead of me, man. What, what <laughs> if we had a... a a Justice League game in the vein of like Mass Effect 2 where the whole objective was to gather the team for the final mission. You know? Like, what if like you didn't get all the characters on the way because you fucked up something? I, I, I feel like that could be cool. Like, the idea um, that like Sean floated out and that I think was like, it sounded like it was alluded to in the article of like each of them. Like, if each of the cities exists on its own, right? And you pick like Octopath style of like, I'm going to start as Batman. And because I start as Batman, this is the opening scene, and something happens, and I have to unite the seven for whatever fucking reason. But there's also stuff I gotta do in Gotham. Here's what it is: and you like, start as Batman because that's what it is. Because everyone's gonna want to play Batman, right? That's what it is. <laughs> I mean, those were the, like the last games that they made. So it's like assuming we we run off of that, playing Batman, and you gotta get the team together. And and that, I think even if you did it that way, right? Even if you decided Batman's the starting point, I think it would be really cool if there was like. There's Gotham, there's Metropolis, there's, um, what was the other one they called out? 
they named it. I don't remember, but there's also Coast City. Coast City, right. Sure. So you get all of their main cities established, and each one of them is a different section of the game. And, like, there's the Gotham-specific missions that you do as just Batman or Batman and whatever other character you chose to unlock first or whatever and da-da-da-da-da. And, like, you can, you know, do stuff city by city in that way. And, like, and then have there be, like, linchpin moments in the game where every character gets together. And the rest of it is just, like, them breaking off in, like, teams of two or teams of three or whatever and, and doing smaller shit. And then you could have it be it like... sounds like you're talking about Dragon Age 1. <laughs> yeah, like that sort of thing, right. Like, and, and I think like having it where there's the different areas with their own set of missions and their own set of villains and, you know, you could go through the motions in each city and kind of, you know, get a flavor of each one and have the main, like, you know, beats of the story be something that's going on with Darkseid. Or, or fucking Starro, apparently. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, the 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 um, oh my god, how am I blanking on their name? Oh, right the now? Legion of Doom. The Legion of Doom, yeah. Yeah, actually, that would be perfect setup. You have the Legion of Doom set up, and each of them is taken over one of these cities. That kind of thing, divide and conquer. But then Lex Luthor breaks them all out at the end, and then you got as long fucking... as Solomon Grundy's there, I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna take the Mass Effect Two pitch of like building the team getting it together and that's the whole game and i'm gonna add a dishonored two twist beginning of the game you're like intro mission batman and superman team up to fight i don't know somebody starro maybe if you want it to be starro um and you're you're doing the switch back and forth to get a handle on the mechanics end of that first mission you pick one of them gets incapacitated for most of the game oh fuck and then you have to like get. The and then rest you of have the to get the team together as Batman or Superman, and then at the end you get the other one back. Yeah, that's, that's actually a good idea. Yeah, I I don't like it because if so, if the character is interesting to play, like I want to play them more than once. You know, like that's I think that's part of the problem with the the, the development of a game like this is that if you have seven characters, like what if I really love the Flash parts? but Flash is barely represented in the game. Or what if Wonder Woman's parts are awesome, but she never appears until the end? You know, like, you'd have to develop, you'd have to give equal time to every character. Yeah, and, and making that satisfying would be hard. Um, yeah. For sure. Yeah, that's, that's like, the problem, like, some parts of Until Dawn even runs into a little bit of, there's some characters you really like, but they just don't get enough time. They don't get as much screen time as other characters that you're less interested in. Right, because there's so many, because there's, what, eight people to, to mess around? Maybe I even seven? So, yeah. I think, but I think there's eight um and it's like there's there's a lot in there that gets like two full chapters by and then you're like what happened to this oh wait now we're playing this person okay like remember that time we played this person hours ago <laughs> yeah i think based on that as cool as this pitch is i'm i agree with sean that i would be much more interested in seeing them do a superman game uh because i think I think a lot of people are always like, oh, how do you even make a Superman game good? Like, he's too powerful. He has too many powers. And, like, I think that's such a stupid, tired argument. Like, I think you could easily make a good Superman game. And I think, like, all of the powers that he has are an easy way to, like, make there be tons of interesting gameplay mechanics. Or you just do the super easy thing that anybody who knows fucking anything about Superman would suggest and just set your limits. Like, have it be set by the similar set of rules as like the silver age superman or like the animated series superman where like he has fucking limitations and just establish them you know like yeah superman's invincible and bullets bounce off of him but if you shoot him with a tank he gets hurt like okay cool you know how you show that you have an opening scene where he's in a fight and he gets hurt and you're like oh i guess those are my limitations um, you know i think you could do a like start figuring out what a good superman game looks like with um at the beginning of September at, I think, PAX, Corey Barlog, who directed God of War, we've been talking about him, uh, yep. pitched a Superman game where he's like, I think Smallville would be a great, like, coming-of-age Superman story would translate really well to video games. Yeah, I think he did a panel with uh, Greg from Kind of Funny and, like, a couple other, like, big Superman fans and game devs and stuff and was like, let's workshop how to make a good Superman game. Yeah, and, like, I think that could be a really cool idea. Yeah. I think so, too. That's, like, a, a really natural, like, doesn't feel 
cheap like oh you're just gonna take away superman's powers it's like well no we're just gonna like make superman earn his powers yeah like he's superboy and like by the end of the movie or movie by the end of the game (laughs) you're fully realized superman the second game it's their problem to figure out how you make that work (laughs) okay as much as i love what we're saying right now i gotta put the win and i gotta i gotta take the one out of your sales of course nobody wants to play a game where you're superman but you're the boy version and you don't have all your powers. I want to play the version of Superman where I am a god. And I think that the way to do that actually speaks to what Corey said. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, one of the things that he said was what a lot of people get wrong about Superman is that it's not about how to work around his powers. It's about how to establish that even though he's as powerful as he is, he can't save everybody. That to me is interesting. You have to save everybody in this burning building. If you don't, you fail, right? So you got to find them. You got to figure out how to use your powers intelligently to, to find and save everybody that you got to save. Um, there could be parts where, okay, well, damn, now Superman's been shot by um, Metallo with kryptonite. Now Sup- now Clark Kent has to figure out the problem and how to solve it. Yep. Um, now you have to deal with Mr. Metzitzelplik, and he's got a puzzle for you. How do you solve it, even though Superman is not a genius? Like, all those kinds of things get around his power set in interesting ways, but you still have those moments where, all right, now it's time to fight Zod, and you kick his ass, you know, and you get that kind of Man of Steel, Dragon Ball Z fight sequence that's really cool and a lot of fun and lets you go all out. And I think Superman, like, you could have so many, like, Uncharted-style moments where there are, like, set pieces of, like, stop the train or, you know, like, uh, I you know, I don't know, like, playoff moments like, oh, like, there's a jumper or something like that. Like, talk him down and have, have him do those kinds of side missions that are, like, both personal and then the big bombastic Uncharted, I'm on a fucking plane that's exploding kind of moments, too, you know? Yep. There's so Mid- much you could do with a Superman game. Yeah, like don't make it about don't make it about limitations. Make it about how powerful he really is, and and have fun coming up with unique challenges. What you're because describing I think, is like One Punch Man, basically, and that's what I love about that show is that he is super powerful, and they keep basically challenging him to show how fucking ridiculously powerful he is, and that's the fun part of the journey. You know, he's fucking overpowered from the first episode. You know, you understand that. And that's what the that's what the genius of it is, you know what I mean? Working that into the story effectively and making that be the focal point about it. Yeah, make it work. And that's the thing is like it's not up to us as pundits or fans or whoever to make it work. It's up to Rocksteady, and I don't have any doubt that they can make a good Superman game. You know, they made uh, two and a half really good Batman games. So <laughs> two and a half. <laughs> Where, where does the half come, though? I'm curious. Arkham the Knight. Parts of Arkham Knight that are in the tank. Yeah, all the, the third one. Yeah, all the all the okay. parts of that game where they just let me play the game and don't force yeah. me to be in the Batmobile, which I just don't want to do ever. Um, yeah. And like, uh, Jonathan Banks is great, but I don't need fucking Mike from Breaking Bad to be Commissioner Gordon two thirds <laughs> of the way through this trilogy. <laughs> Especially when the other guy sounded nothing like him. Yeah. Do you guys honestly think that Rockstar or Rocksteady is developing, uh, whether it's a Superman game or Justice League game, anything like this? No. No, not at all. I do. Because uh, I think... Okay, because I, th- I think they're... Like, they're working on something, right? Like, there's no way that they're not making a game right now. And they... I don't believe that their partnership with WB has ended. So they're likely working on a WB property... I think WB owns them. I right. So I, I think I think you're right that they're a, like a uh, first party studio for them, right? Yes. So if they're like right, so if they're working with WB, they're working on a WB IP. How many things are there even in that you know satchel that aren't that aren't a superhero thing that makes sense as like a big budget AAA video game? There are a couple. Like, Lord of the Rings is one, obviously. Um, Harry Potter. Like, there, there are IP there that they could be working with, but, like, they've done this superhero thing super successfully three times in a row. So, um... Give me an exact remake of Arkham Asylum, except instead of Batman, you're Daffy Duck. <laughs> That's what I want, Rocksteady. <laughs> I mean, 
shit, I'm not against it, but <laughs> but uh, I I think I think it's super likely, Sean, to answer your question. I, I think they're definitely working with a DC property, whether it's Superman, whether it's Justice League, whether it's somebody else that we haven't heard about yet. I think the next project from Rock City that we're going to see is going to be a DC game, and Superman's the the most likely next pick in my mind. I am gonna agree with you. That being said. If we find out that this entire time that Rock City has been secretly working on a uh, like a fucking Harry Potter game, I'm all right. Let's, I'm down with that. <laughs> I actually heard a rumor uh, years ago that they were working on a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. That has been in the 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 rumor mill for a long time as well, which is another yeah. Fucking please sign That's me a up. No brainer. Yeah. yeah, but I, I don't. Mm, oh no, I guess. Is Nickelodeon owned by Warner Brothers? No, right? No, I think Nickelodeon no. is separate. So, because Nickelodeon owns TMNT now, so they'd have to work out the rights there. But mm. that doesn't mean it's impossible, you know. Uh, WB's got those connects, so we shall see. But uh, I, I, if I, if I was a betting man, I would bet DC is the next thing we see from Rocksteady again. So, but uh, any any final takes on this one before we take it home? Um, I. Like, we've heard this rumor so many times at this point. I just, I don't know. It's it's hard for me to take it seriously until we get an announcement. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think this rumor is serious. But for me, there's this rumor has come up so many times that I feel like it, it feels like a where there's smoke, there's fire thing for me. Mm-hmm. Like, I think there's something to this rumor, whether it's this rumor, whether it's the Superman rumor, whether it's whatever. I don't think any of the rumors that we've seen from, like, the 4chan set and and the like are representative of what's actually there but i think the fact that this rumor has come up so many times leads me to think that there's probably some truth to it you know yeah and i i hope you're right i would really love to play a cool superman justice league whatever game yeah me too rock steady i at the end of the day i'm excited for what rock steady has up next whatever it is you know whether it's Batman, it's Harry Potter, it's Superman, it's something new, like, cool, let's do it. Uh, Rock City's great, and I think whatever IP they're working with, they're going to find a way to, to make us care about it, because they're going to get it right, and it's going to look attractive, you know? Um, and in the same way that I think the Arkham games are great, even if you don't give a shit about Batman. They're just better if you do, you know? Yeah. So... Excited to see what's what's next. I figured that would be a fun little, uh, just a fun little, you know, exercise to put our hats on and, and speculate wildly about what that game might look like. So if you guys want to chime in, you can let us know in the comments down below or hit us up at the video game pals at gmail.com. Uh, get at us at the comics pals at gmail.com or what the fuck? The comics pals on Twitter or Instagram or, or whatever other platforms that we're on. Uh, go connect with us and let us know what you're thinking about this. What uh, what would you like to see in Rocksteady's next game? Do you want it to be Superman? Do you like the idea of a Justice League game? Do you want to see them do something new? Or do you have another IP from Warner Brothers Vault that you might like to see them take a stab at? Um, you know, like we threw out Harry Potter. I can't think of what else they really own that's in that lexicon. But uh if you've got an idea, let us know. Hit us up in the comments and, uh, t- and tell us your pitch, and we'll read it next week. Uh, or Andy will read it next week while we're all at New York Comic Con. Yeah. Bitches! Yeah, check it out next week, holding the show down with a special surprise guest host while the rest of the pals are in New York City doing Comic Con related things. They're going to have a bunch of cool content. My content will be cooler. Oh, oh. bold claim. I like it. Gauntlet Throne. Yeah, so now we just have to make sure we get that Tom King interview, Sean. Ask Tom King what he wants to see in Rocksteady's next game. (laughs) Tom King, what are your hopes for the next Batman video game? (laughs) If if we interview Markle's cat and put that up, it will be better than whatever content Andy has planned for the next episode of VGP. Damn. Wow. <laughs> That's rough. I'm, I'm, I'm just playing in my Andy. chair here. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm just <playing. laughs> Hey, you took a shot at me. I had to take one back. <laughs> Though to be fair, I think if we did an interview with Marco's cat, I could make that for some really interesting uh content. I was able to make Phil look funny, so Oh <laughs> I'm sorry, Phil, you edit the show. That's a mean thing to say. You're hilarious. I love you. <laughs> oh man, that, see that was worse than what I said. <laughs> Yeah, but Phil's not here. 
But, so, he, but he's, he's going to hear this. He about. hears it. He listens to every episode. He could, I, like, he's got all the power in the world right now. <laughs> uh, so, uh, barring the fact that Phil has cut me out of this episode entirely, I'm going to take us home. Uh, so before we get out of here, uh, please remember connect with us in all the ways that we said. It helps us out a ton. It helps the show get recognized. I'm especially going to ask you uh, to go and subscribe to our new YouTube channel for the video game pals. Even if you're an audio only listener, you're still listening to us on our old school RSS. Uh, the new channel is um, going to be the home for all our content. It is still very small. Uh, so if you're one of the video game pals faithful, go show us that support. Click that subscribe button. And uh, check out what we're doing over in that space, and uh, and just just show us the support. We 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 could really use it. Uh, and with that, before we get out of here, I'm gonna do us some plug. Mm, do us some plugs. This has been a rough one for me, talking wise. Uh, Sean. All right. Well, <laughs> I am not afflicted with whatever Pete's got going on today, so I will tell you guys that you should listen to the Comics Pals 101. We're we're getting old. Uh, this week we reviewed Doomsday Clock number seven and Heroes in Crisis number one, Hell which yeah! were both very, very big releases from DC Comics and very controversial for interesting reasons. And we also interviewed Kelly Brack. Uh, if you don't know his name, you should listen to that interview because after you do, you will never, ever forget it. As for me, I am on social media at Sean Soapbox, come talk to me about the Dark Phoenix trailer, and we can cry together. <laughs> Eddie? All right, so I don't have any of that cool Comics Pal stuff to plug, but I'm over on Twitter at Tiger underscore Millions. Tweet me and tell me why you agree with me that the Warner Brothers IP rocks that he should really be looking into is the Looney Tunes. Hmm. Let's make a Looney Tunes back in action game. You know, like a tie-in to the 2003 movie starring Brendan Fraser. I want a Looney Tunes game about Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny and Brendan Fraser just going on a wacky adventure. That's awful. Brendan Fraser's like dead or something. <laughs> well, no. I, uh, what I'm what I'm saying here is Rocksteady should be the one who bridges the 20 year gap between the Space Jams. Yeah. Tell me the story. Ooh. Tell me how the Looney Tunes end up in the Space Jam 2 situation. If and with Spa LeBron. If yeah. Space Jam 2 was yeah. a direct sequel to the original Space Jam just as a video game, like in the same style of like the Madden like long shot <laughs> story mode, I would fucking die. That would be the greatest thing that mankind has ever achieved. <laughs> All right, Thompson. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm at Relic Vampire on Twitter. You guys are just talking about nonsense now. We're never getting <laughs> Space Jam 2. Like, no, can... Space Jam 2 like no it's, it's actually happening. It's actually happening. They yeah. haven't... It's never happening. I don't want to believe it. So, Yo, uh, I right? believe in LeBron. He's been trying to make this happen for like 10 years. He uh, his last chance at a ring to make this movie happen. <laughs> uh, well, I also do Palace Play, obviously. We talked about Life is Strange, so we're going to be putting out that this week. That was a blast. Um, if you make it to the end, the last episode is super long. So, you know, that's jam-packed. <laughs> <laughs> what a promo. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like literally we just thought it was going to be shorter. And then it was like, oh, fuck, it's an hour and a half long now. So we're we like, needed to finish it. We're like, we'll, we'll make it like a 45 minutes episode. We'll make it like an hour long episode. We're just going to play it until it's over at this fucking point. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Listen, if you make it all the way to the end fucking hit me up with whatever the last joke we make is i'm pretty sure i'm still sitting on a life is strange code somewhere so <laughs> if you want some free swag go watch that series and subscribe to the channel and let us know and we'll give you some free shit that's official uh <laughs> so uh if you want to connect with me i'm at loud underscore on pete uh, what the fuck <laughs> Loud Why are you under talking? I don't Give know, up. dude. I'm broken inside. Uh, I'm at uh, loud underscore Pete on Twitter and Instagram. I promise I'm a worthwhile follow there because I'm able to put my thoughts together longer. Uh, and I have a cute cat of which I take many pictures. So go go follow me on those platforms. Talk to me about all this all this stuff we discussed this week. Uh, there's been a lot of really cool stuff happening. Um, directly engage with my interests. And uh, most of my favorite fall TV shows are coming back. So if you want to talk about TV, I'm down. Hit me up. We'll talk about that stuff. Uh, as for plugs, I'm on the Comic Spouse with Sean. That interview we did is next level ridiculous. Go check it out. 
Uh, if you haven't listened to the 100th episode of the show, that was a good one, too. Go check it out. Uh, I'm on Pals Play with Thompson. We did Spider-Man two weeks ago. We got Life is Strange this week. It's it's a good time to be Pete and Bessie right now. There's a lot of Pete-centric content dropping. So go check you're that not, shit out. not Pete and Jesse? You, you're not, you're not <laughs> go go kickstart my cookbook, Pete and Jesse's 1,000 Recipes with Pete and Jesse. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then there's also our book club. Uh, out this week, which I wanted to pimp. We had uh, Four Kids Walking to a Bank was out last week. Our Venom book club is this week. Uh, it was a great time. Go check that content out. It's been a blast. And then uh, you can also go check out my new podcast, The Potscast, that I'm doing over at lootpots.com. Uh, it's all Nintendo, so um, we're covering smaller stories that don't make it to the cut on this guy. So if you're feeling like you don't get to hear me talk about Nintendo enough, you can go check that show out as well. Show your support. It mean a lot to me. Uh, so that's that? good. Oh, Did that is say? it. I said, yeah, loopots.com, but it's also on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, all that stuff. Wherever your podcast, you know, hosting platform is, we're probably there. And if not, let me know, and I'll make sure we'll get there. But thank you, Sean. (laughs) So uh, that'll wrap it up for this week on the Video Game Pals. We'll see you next week for 75 with Andy and our very special guest host. Uh, Make sure you keep it tuned. We love you. Check out the new channel. Catch you next week. Take care. Bye, everybody.